Okay. Hi, welcome to this slightly delayed meeting, regular meeting of the Arlington School Committee on Thursday, May 11th, um, 2023. We're sorry for the delay. We have been having some problems with the ACMI broadcast and Zoom. And I think it's going to mean if anyone's actually on Zoom, they may have the volume may be an issue. Watch. Right now, I only know. The, right now, the only person I know of who's going to be on Zoom is Mr. Um, Carden, but he was going to join us late, so we'll watch for him. Um, and that's about it. Uh, so we will begin with public comment. We have two speakers today, and I forgot the blurb that I know oh, here. Let me hold up. Sorry. We seem to be having functional meeting disorder today. Yeah, exactly. It's like, I don't know. Where's, I don't have my, oh, there it is. No. There we go. Okay. Okay, so I want to review the sections of our policy BEDH, which govern public comment. During public comment segment of regular meetings of the committee, individuals or group representatives may address the committee on items of school business. The length of public participation shall normally be no more than 20 minutes, but may be extended by the chair. Speakers must identify themselves by name and address and will be allowed up to three minutes to present their material. A chair may reduce speaking time if needed. I don't think we need to. Improper conduct and remarks, including the use of obscenity or abusive language will not be allowed. Defamatory or abusive remarks are always out of order. If a speaker persists in improper conduct or remarks, the chair may terminate that individual's privilege of address. All remarks will be addressed through the chair of the meeting. Speakers may offer such objective criticisms of the school operations and programs as concern them, but in public session, the committee will not hear personal complaints about school personnel, nor against any member of the school community, except for the school committee or the superintendent in their capacity as operational leader of the Arlington Public Schools. Under most circumstances, administrative channels are the proper means for disposition of legitimate complaints involving staff members. The public is reminded that the school committee does not hold jurisdiction over the performance of school personnel other than that of the superintendent. Thank you. So the first, our first public comment is M. Phillips. Hello, um, I'm M. Phillips. I use they, them, theirs pronouns. I, this closer? Do I need anything else? No. Okay. Just oh, I live on Surrey Road in the Arlington Heights. Um, I am non-binary. I use they, them, theirs pronouns. I'm senior at AHS. And I've been working with the GSA since my sophomore year, and I've been working with the Rainbow Commission since seventh grade. I came before you guys uh, about a month ago to talk about all of the great work that the Rainbow Task Force has been doing alongside Dr. McNeil and Molly Gillis. And since then, a lot has happened in the community regarding LGBTQ discussions. And I just want to remind the school committee uh, that our youth of LGBTQ youth are some of the most important people, to me at least, in this community. And I adamantly fight for them and all of their just acceptance in this community. We have a pride event this Saturday specifically for youth um, in the middle school and the elementary school and the high school to gather together to see that you can make it to high school, you can make it through middle school. We're hoping families come to show that there is a really great world out there. Um, but sadly, that does not excuse some of the disruptions that have been happening with the discussion of the human growth and development curriculum. And again, I just want to come here and say that acceptance and um, inclusion as low as the elementary school levels can be suicide prevention. It starts so young of when we start to internalize hate 
and to get that out of our system, it takes years and years. And when we have a big chunk of our community against that identity that we are questioning, we are struggling with, it can lead to depression, suicide, terrible things that happen, honestly, in the middle school, high school level. And that is still when these members of the LGBTQ community are at Arlington Public Schools and still under this jurisdiction. I do want to say that there has been a lot of work that we have done, a lot of positives. We've like put together all of the rainbow commissions. We are showing on Saturday all of this community that we have built, but that still doesn't mean that we can ignore the hatred that has been building. Thank you so much for letting me come and speak to you. Thank you. And next, um, B. Curteau, Beatrice Curteau. Good evening. Uh, my name is B. Croto, and I am from 67 Overlook Road in Arlington. Um, I graduated from AHS last year, and I just completed my first year at Mount Holyoke College. Uh, during my junior year at AHS, I served as a student representative on the superintendent search committee. Mr. Schlickman and Dr. Hellman, it's nice to see you again. Um, I'm here to offer comment on the need for LGBTQIA plus inclusive curricula across all academic disciplines and the need for mandatory training for faculty and staff on how to foster classroom wide and school wide cultures that are safe for LGBTQIA plus students. Uh, in 2021, results from the Middlesex League Youth Behavioral Health Survey showed that one out of every four Arlington Middle School students reported, reported that, they that they felt overwhelming stress, were depressed, or thought a lot about suicide. Um, most of the time or always. But for LGBTQIA plus students, the results were flipped. Three out of every four, 76%, said that they were depressed or suicidal. Uh, when I was in fifth grade, I was really excited to go to Austin Middle School. I really wanted to learn with the big kids. I was very excited. Uh, but by seventh grade, my mental health profile fit that of the majority of LGBTQIA plus middle schoolers, middle schoolers documented in the 2021 YRBS report. Uh, as I was figuring out how to come up to my as gay to my friends, I attended sex ed classes with the during which the teacher took us on a very long and very thorough journey through the peaks and pitfalls of straight relationships, all the gory details. Uh, she would occasionally mention the homosexuals in passing. In fact, toward the end of one lesson, she turned to look at us and said, you know, you should be friends with gay people. They're actually pretty nice. <laughs> um, I know she meant well, but it was just really weird to hear an adult describe me as if I were someone's special project. Uh, go make friends with a gay kid. They aren't so bad. Um, my experiences are not unique. On honors night for my graduating class, students with the 10 highest grades in that class get an award. Um, two of us in that group were gay and one of them was trans. Um, to my knowledge, that was all of the queer students there, but there were probably more. Um, the trans student and the other gay student had experiences like mine in Arlington schools, meaning that their first formative experiences with anti-gay and anti-trans bigotry occurred with a teacher. Um, in middle school, for example, a trans student was beginning to transition and come out as transgender, and he wanted students and teachers to address him by a different name. Um, I noticed that only one teacher used his new name. Uh, most of the teachers were confused and consistently misgendered him, but a couple of the teachers were openly hostile. Um, by their behavior, they let students know that in their classroom they were free to use the wrong name and the wrong gender and there would be no consequences. Um, I have two moms. I grew up with lots of LGBTQIA plus people in my life. Um, That, that's three minutes, you can finish up. Okay, yourself. thank you. <laughs> um, but watching teachers, and I just wanna let you know that I absolutely revere teachers. I love learning and I love school. Um, but watching teachers behave in that way was deeply unsettling and very confusing. Um, I'll never know if things could have been different for me, but those experiences in seventh grade, combined with the challenges of coming out, created a mental health crisis that was for me and my family devastating. Um, you can see from these stories, Arlington schools are not safe places for LGBTQIA plus students. 
safety is situational. It is completely dependent on who you have as a teacher. And sexuality education should be inclusive of LGBTQIA plus students. History and literature curriculum should also be inclusive, but first, every classroom has to be safe. As a student, I had lots of good experiences with my teachers. I had a great time at AHS, I really loved it. Um, I love saying that I'm from Arlington, but things in middle school could have, and they should have been much better. Um, sorry. <laughs> As leaders, you can make things better. Um, it would be helpful if you had a real understanding of what school is like for LGBTQIA plus students. And you should attend some GSA meetings. You should talk to students and ask them questions. Um, there's a district-wide, as I mentioned, there's a district-wide Pride Festival happening on Saturday and every one of you should attend. Um, you should ensure that training on how to foster a school-wide and classroom-wide culture that is safe for LGBTQIA plus students is not optional. Um, it should be mandatory because all the time, the teachers who sign up for that training are not the teachers who need it. Um, trans people are under attack across the country. It doesn't matter that we are in Arlington, Massachusetts and not Arlington, Texas. These attacks affect all of us. As school leaders and political leaders, who have just dealt with what was, in essence, an attack on gender diverse kids. I ask that you make it very clear that you do not agree with these attacks and that you will be taking action to make sure every classroom from kindergarten to 12th grade is safe for LGBTQIA plus students. Thank you. <laughs> Folks, we need to calm down, please. Um, okay, so I keep forgetting to say at the start, but we don't respond to uh, public comment, but we appreciate your coming and talking. Um, next, we would have the AHS student representative to school committee, but they're, they are not here. So now we have the CPAC report. And this is Lambarton and... Driving, so just tell me when you need the hey, next You slide. can just go to the next slide anyway, since that's just the, plus then everyone will know who's here, because it's, so their names are there. It's Ine, uh, myself, oh, and Jess. <coughs> All right. Um, thank you for having us again this year. We saw you around this time last year, I think. Um, what I wanted to use today's report for was really to talk about what we do as a CPAC because I think it gets a little bit lost um, and also so that you can understand how we can fit better as an asset to the district and to school committee um, because we're well positioned right now and we're doing some good work on acting as a conduit for two-way communication between the district and families and there's basically, uh, stay here, stay here. Okay. There's three things that um, Massachusetts state regulations say that CPACs should do. And that is um, that we should advise you all on matters related to special education students, that we should work with the district on planning and evaluating programming that's relevant to special education students and that we provide with the district uh, a workshop explaining basic rights to parents. So what I'm gonna do going through the slides with Ine and Jess is look at how we are fulfilling those particular goals. All right, go ahead, Liz. So this is a list of all of the workshops that we presented this year. Um, I'd like to note that Oh yes, that's true. One's coming up, please come. Um, sexuality Across the Spectrum, Bodies, Relationships, and Safety for Autistic Youth will be um, presented by Tufts Professor um, Eileen Crahan. So anyone can email arlingtoncpac at gmail.com to get the Zoom link for that one. That will be on Tuesday at seven. The thing I wanna note on this is that the only workshop that is paid for on this list is the Basic Rights Transition Workshop, which is paid through the district's membership with the Federation for Children with Special Needs. 
the rest of the workshops that we present, which are well attended, particularly things like the recognizing and treating anxiety, are done by the goodwill of providers that we beg <laughs> nicely to come and present to us. I know that it's been a topic that's been talked about before, um, but we'd like maybe to revisit with the school committee ways that we could hold a revolving account, for instance, if we were able to fundraise or to have a line item of some sort, but some extra source of funding um, so that we can more consistently present the kinds of workshops that families are looking for. And I want to add that that's also an equity issue because we, many of these folks who come and present for us are in industries that often are underpaid and they're doing this out of the kindness of their hearts, but honestly they should be doing this and getting paid and paid well for coming to speak to us about topics they are actually experts on. Um, and, and then we are undervaluing their work and it's a true equity issue in our communities because of that. The other thing to note on the workshop front is that at our transition workshop, um, I'd like to thank um, Ms. Elmer, who's not here tonight, but and also um, Annalise Abdelnour at the high school. She's the transition coordinator. They had um, a request for Portuguese translation for that meeting, and it was not an easy thing <laughs> to arrange. Um, we had hoped, based on the Federation for Special Needs rhetoric, that they would be more helpful in finding a translator, but they were not, um, and the district paid for that with their Lexikeet membership. Um, we would like to find ways to let parents know that that is more available moving forward. I think that's something when we have the new director of communications that we um, really need to look into because I think parents don't know that that's available and I think it was incredibly valuable. We did have a, a parent come to the meeting um, and use the Portuguese translation channel. All right, next slide. So at our monthly meetings, uh, we alternate mornings and evenings to try and catch as many parents as we can. Um, Dr. Er, well, Dr. I'm Dr. Dr. Barton <laughs> and Ms. Elmer. <laughs> uh, Ms. Elmer comes to every single meeting and most of her staff come to morning meetings that happen during uh, work hours. So that would include most of the coordinators for special education at the various levels. Um, she always gives an update, which is incredibly useful for families, um, not just on what's going on in special education, but in the district generally. Um, and it's very accessible for people who maybe don't feel comfortable listening to a school committee meeting or know how to do that or how to click through the Novus agenda to find all of the information. Um, we also this year had um, Dr. McNeil come and speak with us about the literacy curriculum search. And I really want to highlight that because, again, if you didn't click through the Novus agenda to find Dr. McNeil's talks to school committee, we were one of the few ways that parents learned about the literacy curriculum search. Um, I noticed on some of the social media, like Arlington Parents page, we were um, highlighted when people asked about what was going on with the literacy curriculum. They said, oh, I saw a CPAC presentation. It's the only thing I've heard about it. Um, go look here and you can see the presentation. So we really are a source of information that's accessible for parents. We also at the beginning of the year had um, Magali Olander before she was acting in her position as director of SEL. I think at the time it was like mental health outreach was her job. Um, came and talked about all of the mental health screeners that the schools are doing at the various age levels um, and parents could come with questions about those. We do meet with um, Dr. Homan and Ms. Elmer. We've met with Dr. Homan twice this year and with Ms. Elmer regularly, we have a great relationship. Um, and we also had, as those of you who were running again this year know, a Meet the Candidates Forum for parents. Um, Which has actually been um, asked about multiple times since. Right, yes, apparently our minutes are being slow, so people really want to see this. <laughs> <They're up now. laughs> Just says they're up now, so you can see. Um, but one of the things that was highlighted in our, our talk with Desi during the tiered focus monitoring process, um, Ine and I had an interview with the, I, I don't either, 
with the on-site rep who was conducting the interview, um, is that one of the areas of weakness that the district could work on with their CPAC is our role in providing feedback on the planning and development, development of special education programming, and I think Ine might be a good one to talk about access there. So you want to move to the next slide? So we did, so we do, you know, a bunch of planning and, and advisory, which, which uh, Sarah's already talked about. I think we're on the next slide. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, no, go back. Sorry. Tonight's the night of fun with functionality. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, we've developed really great uh, relationships, I think, throughout the district. Um, we have good relationships with building principals, with different administrators, and even some folks uh, on the ground. But what we don't have access to and what we don't have uh, the ability to, to really glean information so that we can, one, provide it to families, and two, also provide back to the district, is how are these programs working for families? Um, what do these programs actually look like? What does that feel like for a kiddo in that, in that particular classroom, in that particular building, in that particular, um, you know, with the type of supports a particular kiddo may be getting? Even understanding that these are individualized and they should be, and so every student is going to have a slightly different interaction with whichever type of supports they're having, we don't have access to any of that information. Some of that's for privacy concerns, and we fully understand that. But there are ways in which we can evaluate these programs that we are not really given access to. Um, recently, I've had uh, a couple of different families ask me, um, hey, my kid was just diagnosed as autistic. I know there's programs, but what do they look like? What do they do? How does that work? Um, and I can't answer that because I don't, I've, I've never actually been able to go into the building and, and see what that looks like and to get a feel of it. Um, and, and, and when I get feedback from families, the, the challenge is it's, there's no reference point, right? It's the, it's, the one, it's the one story, but without any parameters on what, what the program ought to look like and what the child is or isn't accessing in that particular environment. So we don't have any way to evaluate or discuss even the ways in which we're going to continue to develop or continue to um, support our students as a whole. And that is an area that we're not sure how we, we do this, but I think that we need some better transparency and communication around and, and problem solving around how do we do a better job of telling our families, no, no, really, they're doing a great job with your kiddo. It's just that, like a lot of things, it's a black box. They go into the building, they come out the other end, you, you, just, you just don't know. And that doesn't fill anyone with any confidence ever. I mean, mm -hmm. how anxious do you all feel when, when you're like, and I'm going to drop it, this thing, my, my child off somewhere, and they're going to come out the other end, and hopefully it worked, right? Like, that is not a thing that it, it, that it inspires people any confidence. So having some, some window into what could it look like, what should it look like, what are we trying to do, how are we trying to do it, what is the philosophy, and what is the, the theoretical modeling that we're utilizing in a lot of this programming, in a lot of these structures and supports, so that we can also support our families in feeling more confident in the programming that we have, which much of which is, is working for a lot of our families, and also then maybe advocating for it to be better because maybe the program isn't actually working the way it's modeled to, right? Maybe this is the theory and this is the philosophy, but we're not actually, the program actually isn't working at that level. And we, we have no access to any of that information. We would really, honestly, I mean, I have a background in ed. Sarah has some ed background. I mean, like, we're, we're deep in this, and, and what we want to do is build a better system for everybody. Like one of the easiest examples to give is if you all remember when SLCD opened two years ago now, um, we found out at the same time as everyone else. So obviously we were not involved in the planning there. I would like to highlight that um, this year we've been involved in quite a few hiring committees, which is an improvement. Um, we are getting 
more input into um, those central office positions um, and are able to represent special education families at those. So that's, that's a movement forward, but sort of on the transparency front, some more on programming would be great. All right, next slide. So we did the survey. So I'm not gonna talk too much about the survey because um, it's linked in this presentation, which you have, and it was provided to you in the materials um, okay. for the meeting. It's very difficult to make any sweeping statements because everyone's experience is highly individual. Mm -hmm. um, everyone's philosophy on public education and what its aims are and what services they feel entitled to or expect and what outcome they expect from public education varies widely. Um, it can be difficult because obviously when you're in the special education, when you first encounter the special education system, a lot of parents are in a very emotional state because they have either just received a life altering diagnosis for a child or their child is struggling so much in school that things are breaking down at home. So it's stressful and everyone's emotions are high. Um, what helps in those situations is clear expectations, so, transparency yeah. and communication and, and Ina is gonna stop me from drifting. <laughs> so the other reasons why there's, it's hard to make some sweeping statements about what, ha what, what the, the survey this year states, we had significantly fewer respondents some of which I think is just a lot of people's return to work and, and, and the sort of balance of everyone no longer being home all of the time, being a piece of it. Um, as we always state, we have challenges with getting things translated and, and accessible to folks. It's only online, so these are all real limitations to our survey. Fundamentally, we have the same themes coming up, but since it's just a year since our last one, we're not gonna see any true trends yet but we hope to continue to do this so that we can see trends and see what, where we, we are maybe making some headway and where maybe we're actually starting to lose ground in certain areas. So some of those areas are transparency. <laughs> All right, communication, this is my, this is my, if I was gonna hammer home, this is my little pet project. Um, transparency and communication. So not every parent is going to be happy all the time with what services are offered to their child and how the process goes. But it goes a long way if everyone starts the process understanding what's going on, what the expectations are, and how decisions are made. So then you can disagree about the decision that's been made, but you understand mm -hmm. what rubric is being used mm -hmm. to evaluate. To parents right now, it can feel very isolating and confusing and opaque. So when things are going well, and we do have quite a few people on our survey who have reported positive experiences, it's because the team is open and transparent and flexible. And when it's not going well, then you see those answers where it's difficult to get email responses, um, people don't feel heard, they don't feel as though the words that they are saying are being listened to or respected. Um, and students also have reported feeling unseen or not like they belong in their classrooms. So I would encourage you to read through particularly the comments, the qualitative comments that were listed in that survey so that you can get an idea of the balance of how families are feeling. And it really does fall across the spectrum. It is not all terrible doom and gloom news, but it is also not all roses. All right, let's go to the last slide. You know you wanna talk about our priorities for next year? Priorities, all right. Um, we really, really would love some way to fund the programming that we're doing. Um, free labor is, is a problem for everybody. And um, if we were able to fundraise and then use those funds, that would, that would we were, we're happy to do so. But as it stands, Whatever funding we raise goes to the general fund and we don't have access to that unless someone else gives us access to that specifically and I don't know that, that that's really quite equitable for the work that we're doing. 
And we do a lot of work. So being able to do so would mean the world to not just us, but the families that we serve, which is all the families you all serve. Um, so that's one. Uh, two, we really, really want to be much better embedded in how we develop, how we strategically plan for, and, uh, and evaluate the programming that we have and how well that is or isn't serving families with the caveat that not everyone can be happy and we understand that. I mean, I, I, I promise you, my kids are a pain and I am not happy with what's going on and some of that's us and some of that's the district, but that's not my agenda. My agenda is how do we make it better for everybody and I want to be clear that I'm not in this for me. I'm in this for the 900 and I don't remember however many yeah. I something IEPs we have in this district. And for all of the other students who are being supported because those students are being supported, right? All of the supports that we put in around those students also support all of the other students in those classrooms. Um, and uh, really, we, we just would love to have better communication, which I appreciate we are working on. But for many of us, it's a long road and it's been very quiet. Um, so a lot more transparency, a lot more consistency, and, um, and some transparency about the accountability of what is or isn't happening behind the scenes. I think I got it all. Sound about yeah, right? I think we're good. Yes, do you have anything? Great. Questions, comments? Okay. Anyone have questions or comments? Mr. Shookman. Okay. Um, I had a good time meeting with the CPAC at the candidate swarm, and I think between you and the SPED Alliance, uh, there are a lot of really good questions raised and a lot of good perspectives put out there, and I hope you continue to do that going forward. Um, you're, you're right in that we're dealing with a lot of individual uh, education plans, and that where we as a committee can get a sense of something that's public and sort of universal like what's going on in second grade. It's really very difficult for us to get a sense of what's happening with the, the 900 or so IEPs that are being written every year. Uh, a lot of questions that came up had to deal with trust between parents and the district. And understanding the trust is a lagging indicator and that it takes a long time to uh, ruin a reputation and it takes a long time to build it back up. Um, my question is, do you think it would be helpful to collect data on how many team meetings are conducted in which outside evaluators, advocates, or attorneys are participating? I'm not certain, I mean, the data is always useful to just have as data, but I don't know that it's indicative of anything specifically because in part, like you said, that trust and that mm -hmm. and relationship building comes over time, but mm -hmm. there's also a reputational piece. And so there are many families that are new to the system mm -hmm. of special ed within our school district who, who through outside sources are then, mm -hmm. Uh, uh, I lost the word, uh, um, encouraged, encouraged mm. to bring a lawyer or bring Probably an advocate mm. yeah. um, before they've ever met, like this is their first encounter with the SPED, mm -hmm. you know, in general, and, and, um, and they bring someone. So I'm not sure that it, it's clear data in any way, shape, or form, so I'm not sure what it would, what it would illuminate. So how do, we, how do we get at this trust issue then? So Transparency. Can you speak into the mic? Transparency. I mean, it's really about the more often, so if you look through the comments, mm -hmm. right, almost always the, the families that trust that the district is, is at least trying and working towards the best interest of their child are the ones where not only the, the child feels that they have a sense of belonging in their particular school system, and their specific mm -hmm. small system, but also where the family feels belonging in the process, right? So a lot of this has to do with how do we, and I know this is part of the strategic plan as well, mm -hmm. overall, how do we ensure that our families 
district-wide feel like they actually belong as part of our district, mm -hmm. right? You know, a thing I've brought up time and time again is we have these SLCs, right? We have these separate learning communities that really serve um, some students who have much greater needs and, and they need mm -hmm. a very specific uh, environment. Mm -hmm. However, a lot of those families have a hard time feeling like they belong in that school because their child is bused in from a different area of the town mm -hmm. and those students don't stand outside with any other students before they come into the building. They're marched straight into their classroom. They don't actually get to spend any time with them. Mm -hmm. And it, depending on the school, they go in through a completely different door mm -hmm. than everyone else does, right? Like these are, they're, they're small, but they're very, mm -hmm. very, very clear messages that these kids are bused in and out of here, but they don't belong here even if that's not what the teachers are saying, mm -hmm. right? So we have some real structural barriers of how do we create belonging? Mm -hmm. I, w I, w I worry about the trust issue because it's something that's not measurable, readily measurable. And you know, the thing is from our perspective as a school committee, what we do is we do strategic plans and uh, do all these broad evaluations uh, at this table. Uh, either programmatically or evaluating the superintendent. And, and I'm sort of looking, this is the hardest thing to get a hold of. Because as a principal, I sat through every one of my building's uh, team meetings. So I knew what was going on. And I, but but as, as a school committee member, you've got almost a thousand of these going on every year. We've got no sense of whether or not we're doing, what we're doing is successful. So I think as well, um, I don't think that measuring advocates is a great way to go because mm -hmm. one thing you're just measuring privilege. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good um, point. Also, it's not just an Arlington culture problem, but mm. a special education culture problem, and one that I personally overcame when my kids were little is that the rhetoric around it is that you are your child's, you know your child best, you understand what your child needs the best, and your job is to fight mm -hmm. for your child and you are your child's advocate. So I almost went in with like battle armor on, right? Like I'm gonna mama bear this. Mm -hmm. um, so then you're starting from a, a position where it mm -hmm. feels like the district is the opposition. The other problem that we have is that there is a, a reputation problem. Mm -hmm. As I know Mr. Carden would tell you, our tiered focus monitoring previously was mm -hmm. not good. It is, it, we passed everything this year, right? It was better. Um, but that positive feedback loop of reputation is very difficult to break. So when people a, a, feel 18 like... Year, 18 years ago, the, the state called Mr. Thielman in when he became chair of the school committee to deliver the report because it was probably the worst. Right, that and, the and memory is long. And one of the comments that we got on our survey was um, from parents who were unhappy that this year's survey listed sort of questions as this year in your, re in your interaction with the school, mm -hmm. what happened? Mm -hmm. Because they said, well, I still have things that I haven't been able to mm -hmm. communicate mm -hmm. or voice from previous years and I'm still holding that and I have no place to put it. And who wanted to be able to put into the survey mm -hmm. things that happened before because it's your child mm -hmm. and it's very, a motive. So yes, the, the point is that it is very difficult to get to a place where it's not a question of people just saying Arlington is notorious for X, Y, Z. But the other thing is that the survey that we're doing is, is over time hopefully going to show mm -hmm. the trend, mm -hmm. hopefully, right, that this yeah. is a thing that's improving as opposed to devolving. Um, and that is part of the reason why we're doing this, so that we can gather that type of data. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is such an ephemeral piece, trust, mm -hmm. but it is absolutely essential when you're sending your kid to a building and you hope that they're coming out the other end better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. yeah, thanks. Okay. And which is why I have high hopes for the Welcome Center and the Communications mm -hmm. Director mm -hmm. and all of those kind of moves. I think, yeah. I like fingers crossed, knock on wood, <laughs> is Just where that trust piece comes from. Yeah. Any right. other? Ms. Exton? Um, I appreciated your reflection on um, wanting to be able to give sort of feedback or be involved in the, in the various programs. And I also appreciate that each individual student has individual needs. But I guess I'm 
curious about two things. One, are you aware of CPACs in other districts where they have those kinds of opportunities to somehow get, whether it's a presentation by the program directors, whether it's a present, whether it's as the program is developing that they've given feedback, because a lot of the programs that we have in Arlington overall are um, programs for a, a identified disability, and so there are best practices around teaching students with that identified need. There are programmatic recommendations that that program should have. So I guess I'm just trying to figure out, like, do those programs ever get reviewed as an individual program? Because it does, that does feel like something that CPAC should have an opportunity to reflect on and give feedback. And so yes, there, there are districts that do have that, that role that they are much more active and involved in. Um, there are plenty of other CPACs that don't. That's absolutely true. It goes both ways. Um, so there, we have very specific programming, and then we have sort of diffuse programming because, like we said, every child has a different plan, right? Uh, and there are very specific best practices, but there's also the piece where sometimes when you're in the middle of the storm, you can't tell how you've constructed the building. Right? So you're in this house, but you actually don't know how the house is built. I said storm, I meant house. Anyway, um, so the, the question is, if, if, if the REACH program is constructed in X, X particular way, what are those parameters and, and how do we know what that is? Right? Philosophically or best practices or which research? And then if that's the case, how are we implementing them? Right? We're, we don't have access to any of that. Because if we have that as our benchmarks, then we can actually, as outside observers and talking to, you know, we can ask families if they would be willing to anonymously tell us, which many of them may or may not, depends on the programming, because sometimes there's too few kids in it and then they feel like it's too identifiable, understandable, whether or not they feel like uh, that program is actually hitting those benchmarks that we've already laid out because we understand what the philosophy is for the particular programming, what the best practices are, what those best practices are built on, right? Like, we have the capacity to do all of that. We don't have any of the access to any of it. Right, and I, that's, I guess, my sort of, is there a cycle of revisiting those, that, those programs and asking these questions? How, because the chair focus monitoring is like looking at paperwork. Yeah, it's most, I mean, the, <laughs> yeah, the TFM is mostly about whether or not we've dotted all of our I's and crossed yeah, right. our T's and showed right. up on time. <clears throat> so you can do systematic program reviews, and we've had some pro some organizations that do some of those program reviews in not to do program reviews, but to do professional development, particularly for the teachers. For example, at Hardy, where the new uh, where the program has moved, um, that was previously at Bracket, um, the SLCC. So. And we've partnered with programs, with organizations like that also to provide professional learning and some program development work at Stratton. Uh, I know that happened two years ago. I would have to ask Ms. Elmer um, when the last time was that we did a program review. I think it was done by lab most recently. Yes. Um, and I forget the year. It was, yeah, it was a while ago. So one of the things that's in the strategic plan is to create a review cycle for curriculum programs and creating a similar mirrored review cycle of every couple years one of these programs is up for an audit by one of these companies is something that we could budget for with a sort of mirrored system to the curriculum reviews. Again, I would need to talk to Ms. Elmer about that and then also think about how we would involve CPAC. But I also want to add that we're not talking about just specific programming for our sub-separate spaces. Mm -hmm. We're also talking about the curricula in general because most of our students are in, are in, in inclusive mm -hmm. settings, which mm -hmm. means that the curriculum you're using in math or in social studies mm -hmm. still has to have enough um, supports built in. I mean, I, I would hope that they're actually all done mm -hmm. in a, um, why did I just read that? Universal design. Universal design. design. Thank you. It's my it's my favorite term. If whether or not the the, <coughs> the curricula are actually de developed with universal design in mind or not, right? And whether or not that implementation of that is actually occurring in the classroom or not, mm -hmm. right? 
because it can be built a certain way, but uh, I mean, some of you have taught in the classroom, it doesn't always hit the ground that way, right? So there's, there's no knowing, but that is actually just as important to our students who have IEPs as they are to everybody else, but in some ways more so because we're talking about an equity issue as well then, right? Um, I think this is another place too where like rhetoric around MTSS uh, is a question of whether where the rubber meets the road, right? We can talk a good game about MTSS, but if we're talking about every student being served at tier one, then how are we going to check? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Did I ask your question? Yes, I did. Okay. okay. I think Mr. Cardin has his hand up. So. We're going to see if we can hear you. Um, Ms. Dickin? Yeah, oh. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. All right. Well, first, I want to thank the CPAC for all their work and for presenting and doing the survey. It's, it's very valuable to the district, uh, and we appreciate your partnership and all your hard work. Um, just a couple of comments. So on the, on the communication and the, and the uh, some of the issues that I think um, people are coming to us about, uh, you know, I, somebody suggested to me, I mean, partly it's because of the turnover, right? So we still have a lot of turnover with our team chairs and liaisons. So that's part of the problem. But so I, I do think we should look into building a training program for that role in particular, because it's so important. And, and somebody suggested to me that, you know, one of, again, one of the, the issues is the communication and the empathy that is or is not being shown by these people, which is which is hard to train for, but there are people who do that. I mean, there's a whole team of facilitators at the state level. Somebody's training them how to do a facilitated IEP meeting. So there, there should be someone who can help us, particularly for the, the people that are new to this role, um, get some training. So that's just a suggestion. And then um, you mostly covered, you know, the discussion about where the CPAC can have input. And I think that's a good discussion and something that we should work on going forward. And I'm hoping that as the strategic plan moves forward, MTS, the MTSS initiative will, you know, will, will cover some of the special education entry points and um, uh, programming as well um, so that the CPAC can help us in that process as well. Thank you. I know, I know, I know, Allison's, I know Allison's not here tonight, tonight but, um, but um, I, would, I do know that they, that they did, in fact, do some um, active listening training. Mm -hmm. Very recently. And conflict resolution training recently, which I, mm -hmm. I have heard has been very helpful. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, right. more of that. <laughs> um, okay, I think. I just want to chime in because. I'm looking at this in so many places where it says parent, you could replace it with teacher, and the same statement would be true. Um, and we've been having a lot of district level discussions about special ed because our focus this year was how do we support our special ed staff? Um, because they've been drowning through the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And it's gone, interestingly. Um, the, the low numbers have not helped, like the, the, the vacancies make it hard. Um, but one of the sort of lights that we've managed to turn on is and this kind of goes to what Paul was saying and what you were saying is that we don't have a good shared vision of what advocacy looks like. And I think we run into situations where we're all fighting for what we think is best for the kids. And it's not the same thing and we're not good at communicating why we think that's best for the kids or seeing the other side of it. And so you end up with a teacher who's saying, I think this kid needs to go for an outplacement because they have more, they, they need more than we can give them and they deserve more. And you've got the district saying, I don't want to outplace the kid. And the teacher hears, or the parent hears, it's too expensive. And what the district is thinking is the best place for this kid is their home school. And th when they go, they're not coming back. And we want to keep this kid in their home school. And how do we fight to do that? And I think the more we can get at the why, and the more we can explain our thinking when we're in these meetings, rather than just making decisions and sticking to them, that's how we build that trust. So I, I would agree that. Um, like education, for instance, on the least restrictive environment, which is the legal requirement for where kids should be, as well as very clear communication to parents <coughs> who, unlike me, don't watch every 
school committee meeting on Zoom what MTSS is and that the fact is that the goal is to meet students' <coughs> needs regardless of disability in the classroom. You know, and that tier one is for everyone and that, and that therefore the, the general education teacher may feel like they're advocating for a student and saying like this student needs more from the special educator because I don't know what to do, but the answer there is then that we need to teach that general educator what to do because that general educator is responsible for everyone in the classroom. And if the child needs extra support at tier two, that's great, but that doesn't take away the tier one responsibility. Okay, well, th thank you very much. Thank you. Um, do you have anything you wanted to add? Only to say thank you for the comprehensive feedback. We will go through it together and keep think, keep meeting and thinking together about um, how to meet the needs of families. I'm very excited about the Director of Communications and Family Engagement working directly with you all um, to build out some of this programming and to have a cohesive approach to how we engage parents and help inform them about the work of the district and work that will help them and us better serve kids. Um, and I can always count on the two of you and um, everyone else in CPAC and all the conversations that we have to raise the very complex challenges and highlight how they all fit together um, exceptionally well, which you've done tonight. So thanks so much for all the work you do for our families. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so next we have the elementary literacy curriculum recommendation and possible vote uh, with Dr. McNeil. Um, before Dr. Homan gives an introduction, <coughs> I just want to point out, so I think BEDA allows the chair to determine that it would be beneficial to extend the presentation time and because of the importance of this topic mm -hmm. and because we didn't have a super full agenda, I have asked Dr. McNeil to not only give us the presentation that he was anticipating, but to also go into in depth a lesson plan for one of the modules and some of the things that we would see in it. So his, his presentation is going to take longer than our 15 minutes, and that is with my blessing and request, and now Dr. Homan. Yeah. So um, before Dr. McNeil gets started, I just want to note what an uh, extensive, comprehensive, time-consuming uh, process this has been and also challenging at times. And we have finally arrived at a decision and we're also still learning about this curriculum as a system, about what it's going to look like when we implement it in APS. Uh, so while I know Dr. McNeil will go into a little bit of detail on a lesson, um, that is a new, like, that. this is all still really new <laughs> to all of us, uh, and we haven't been trained <coughs> yet, so we will be, um, and we won't be able to answer every single question probably tonight, uh, but as they arise and as they emerge, uh, we certainly are happy to address them. So Dr. McNeil has done an extensive amount of work on this, and I'm looking forward to the presentation. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, this is the final selection slide, I mean slide presentation that I have created. Um, I have, I just wanna review that we've been coming, I've been coming and giving you updates throughout the, throughout the years uh, since last year. So uh, this is a recommendation on behalf of uh, Dr. Holman. We have made this recommendation to Dr. Holman and now we're making a recommendation to the school committee. Uh, so we can go to the next, the first slide. Thank you. So the objectives of this slide deck is, or this presentation is to review the selection process, um, present selection data, identify the final selection or, or our recommendation, uh, give an anatomy of a module that's uh, located inside of the program, provide a lesson example, and then uh, respond to comments or, and questions. So just to review the process uh, real quickly, this is uh, some of the highlights. It was a 12-month process. We established a district core literacy team that um, can, uh, uh, 
consisted of people from various roles because we wanted to make sure we got a diverse set of perspectives as we thought about uh, what our next literacy program should offer. We partnered with the Hill for Literacy. Uh, they have extensive um, experience with uh, creating a selection process and they also provided us with the review tool that we use to evaluate the programs. Um, the data selection process, it included K-5 staff, community members, and families. We had family and staff publisher roundtable discussions. Uh, we did a, and then we, on, on top of that, we did a district team analysis, uh, which included visits to other school districts to, to observe the implementation of each of the final programs that we were considering. This is just a timeline, I'm not gonna go through it, uh, so people can read through the timeline, and then if you see the link at the bottom of the slide, that is a, a comprehensive schedule of everything that was included in the in, in list of various activities that we um, conducted in order to come to this final selection. Again, I'm not gonna go too extensively into this, this is just a a review of the tool and the different elements of each program that we reviewed. Um, the review tool, like I mentioned before, came from the Hill for Literacy, uh, and because they've had extensive uh, experience with uh, using various tools, they they looked at the they've combined uh, tools from uh, other research research organizations um, in order to come up with the tool that we we utilized. So the next slide, um, we're gonna look at some of the data collection results. This is a table and a graph, um, and I'm just gonna explain very briefly what this represents. Uh, just looking at the chart, uh, looking at some of the acronyms there, um, I, the ID stands for instructional design, the V stands for vocabulary, the C for comp uh, comprehension, CRSE, is the cultural responsive sustaining education, and then you have writing. So as I mentioned before, we used the review tool, and we had uh, various rounds uh, that, we, uh, that took place throughout the year. We had vertical teams at each one of our schools that included all staff. They completed the review tool, um, and then this is the representation of the various components of the review tool. So each review, the review tool have various elements that um, we need to consider based on research that need to be considered when you're evaluating various literacy programs. And so once we, they completed that tool, we sent it to the Hill for Literacy and then they scored it. And this is a percentage, as you look at the percentages in the graph or in the chart, those are the percentages of the total possible points that are available on each element. If a certain element was not filled out, um, just to give you an idea of the uh, scoring that took place, it was zero to three. And if, the, if a certain element was not filled out, then it was not counted in the total possible points. So as you can see, um, and, the, and the reason why you see this, there were, there were many more components of the review tool that were considered, but as we got closer to making a final selection, we narrowed it down to these five different areas that we wanted to make sure that we had, that we were considering as we move forward. You'll see what's missing in there is phonics, phonemic and, um, awareness, but we had already taken care of that and we've done extensive early literacy work over the last uh, two or three years and so we have that in place. So we're not really looking for these programs to address that because our K through three early literacy instruction, we have adopted Hegarty for phonemic awareness we have foundations that we teach K through three, and we have our decodable text. We're not getting rid of any of that. Um, we're gonna keep that in place. And so these are the five other areas that we wanted to consider on top of the early literacy instruction and, and the work that we've done around that. And all that is based on the science of reading. So this is the tool that, you know, the, that was sent out to all the elementary schools and the different vertical teams um, scored. So as you can see there, um, that's representative of the percentage. So we go to the next slide. Sorry. So this is a district uh, result. As we were getting closer to the making a final selection, I, we noticed that some of the sections, there were some, some quite substantial or chunks of the tool that were not completed. 
So what I did in order to enhance the process or supplement the process, we put together a district team of individuals from the core team that we had created last year. And then we asked our literacy coaches also to ask uh, other teachers who, if they could join. And we took two days to really do a deep dive with our literacy coaches and other uh, individuals who we recruited to be a part of the process. And they took two days per program because we had three finalists. And they took time to really dive in to make sure that we were handing in completed tools. So in any area that was not completed from the tools that were sent out to the schools, we could rely on these completed tools from our literacy coaches <coughs> and other people who uh, did a deep dive over the two-day period and, and just compare and contrast uh, what the, the, how the results came out. And so we, this is a representation of a, a full completed tool. Again, we're focusing on those five areas. Um, and then these are the percentage of the points, uh, of the total points that um, were available. And as you can see, there's a, there's a little difference uh, because if you look at the ones that were filled out by the, all the schools, if you look at the average, the final averages, they were so close, it was the, the results were almost negligible. So we really looked at the district um, perspective as well, that completed tool, and that really gave us a, a strong indication of the program that we wanted to select, and, or the strong indication that we, what we wanted to recommend to Dr. Holman. We can go to the next slide. Excuse me. So those three colors of the three programs you evaluated on the bar chart, is that what you? Yeah, they can't quite see that. You can't see. Which color is uh, which. Yeah. I, yeah. So, so if you look at the bar chart, uh, the blue represents EL education. The red is my view literacy. Mm -hmm. And the green would be wit and wisdom. I'm sorry, the legend didn't come out the yeah. did that Did that answer your question? Yeah. That, okay, that, perfect. That, yeah. Any other questions about the data? Can, sorry, can you say again what the ID? Instructional design. Instructional design, okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, so I'll, I'll go through that. The instructional design, V is vocabulary, C is comprehension. You got it? Okay. Perfect. Mm -hmm. So next slide. Percy, can I ask a question? Oh, yep. you, you don't have any anecdotal stuff from the data collection, right? Just oh, I have tons of anecdotal <laughs> stuff. <laughs> oh, I have tons. Okay. Thank you for your question. So, <laughs> so in the in the tool, and this is something the, another benefit of having the district team really dive in, like creating a district team, is on the tool you have a you know the different columns, you have the different elements. And then and it's arranged by grade level. And so then they have a column for notes. So the notes were completely filled out. Some of the notes were not complete out, uh, completely filled out from the, all the staff conducting the review. But the district team in that two-day dive, they re I, I told them, I really want you to like give a comment on each element so that I could understand your thinking as to why you scored a certain element a certain way. And so they provided that uh, type of, um, um, they provided that documentation. So I have an actual tool, the tools, and we have a spreadsheet with all the tools on there, with all the uh, anecdotal uh, notes from the schools and from the district team. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Next slide. So our final selection that we came out with was EL education. So our recommendation is going to be EL education. And I'm going to go through some of the key attributes of the program. Uh, I'm also going to give like an anatomy of one of the modules so you can kind of get an understanding of um, what this program can offer. And then at the end, I have some resources that I'll also uh, direct you to if you want to get more information or do a, a deeper dive. And I will say that I did send out a link to the entire uh, Arlington School community that included parents that gave a link in those links for each one of the programs or where they could do a deep dive, look at lesson materials, look at the modules, see how they're constructed. Um, and then they, they were also invited to a publisher's roundtable where the publishers each came and presented 
um, and why they thought that their program was the best. So we have a, an extensive amount of uh, background material that are, is available to parents if they want to go now dive into, and I have those links at the end of the slide deck. So looking at the final selection, some of the key attributes, and, and again, this is based on the science of reading and, and what is best practice. Um, so you have knowledge building, building so the, the way that the modules are set up, uh, they're set up uh, thematic units, so the students are um, developing their literacy skills as they learn about various topics associated with social studies and science. They have access to complex text, robust vocabulary instruction, accountable talk that's supported by protocols, higher level questioning, integrated writing instruction, explicit instruction in morphology and grammar, and pur purposeful, meaningful project-based learning. So everything is like integrated together. So when we talk about interdisciplinary units, the EL education program definitely has that. We can go to the next slide. So this is the, so when you think about EL education, the way that we're going to receive our professional learning is we're going to receive it in two segments. You're going to have the K-2, because the K-2 modules are constructed a certain way in order to address specific skills that we know we want our early learners to have. And then we have grades three through five. That will be another segment of the uh, professional learning because those modules are also constructed with the learner in mind, so they're going to be developing certain skills for skills that are um, needed for students in grades three through five. So looking at the module lessons, there's a focus on teaching and assessing reading comprehension, writing, listening, speaking, and language. And then for the K-2 modules, you have your skills block. But I want to say that, again, I want to uh, emphasize that we're not really looking at the program to provide that. So that's a part of the program that we're really, we, we're going to purchase it, but we're not going to really use it. We can maybe use it for intervention, but we've got to still think about that as part of the learning that we're going to go through um, and, and to really think about uh, that portion of the program. Because we have our skills block, which will be utilized to continue what we've already started in early literacy instruction, and that's addressing those foundational reading skills as we continue to use foundations, Hegarty, and, deco and decodable texts. Also, <clears throat> in the, that's available at the K-2 uh, level, you have labs, which incorporates project-based learning that reinforces the content that's taught in the module lessons. So in the module lessons, you have the lessons, you have the skills block, and you have the labs. And so the labs reinforces the content knowledge, literacy skills, oral language, and habits of character taught in, in, that's taught in the module lessons. And it provides time for teachers also to have small groups and one-on-one -on -one support, provide small group and one-on-one -on -one support for students as they look at and they can differentiate their instruction to meet the needs of individual students. Next slide. So when you look at the modules, they're taught in a certain sequence. The module one is for K-2, the focus is on building literacy in a collaborative classroom. It also establishes routines, introduces those various protocols that we'll use for uh, accountable talk that supports a peer-to-peer -peer discussion. And then you have learning through science and stories, and that's where that, you know, the other content, the knowledge building comes in, and that's where you're introducing complex text. They're growing as researchers because as you get deeper into the modules that are teaching a, a, a certain a topic, they're going to research that using the various um, texts that are available and also other sources. And then contributing to the community, that's where they can also look at the project-based learning and apply what they've learned in the first two, three modules. So the next slide offers K through two. These are the topics that are available. And so each module you'll see there, those are not live links. So I just want to say, I, that's a screenshot. That's the reason why they're that color. But at the end, you'll see that there's a link, and you can dive into the modules through that link. So just to note, none of our links are live. So if mm -hmm. we can just That's a get, PDF, yes. If we can just get a email of PDF to us later of this, that'd be okay. awesome. Yes, we Thank can you. definitely do that. I got all the information you need, Jane. It's coming at you. 
All right, so our three five modules. So they're, they're constructed a little differently because they're, they're, again, they're looking at the developmental needs of those students that are in grades three through five. And so there's a focus, again, on teaching and assessing reading comprehension, mm -hmm. writing, listening, speaking, and language. But in the, for the th uh, grades three through five, you have, they call the all block, which is additional language and literacy. That's an acronym. It wouldn't be education if we didn't have an acronym. <laughs> um, and it provides time for independent reading, individual and small group work to reinforce, again, going back to the modules, it's reinforcing what's taught through the module lessons, which is the reading comprehension skills, the practice of oral language and vocabulary development. Okay, everybody still with me? Mm -hmm. All right. So the next slide, you see that these are the different topics that are um, available uh, in the different modules for grades three through five. So the three through five module progression is they, um, the, first, the first, again, the module one is setting up all the rest of the modules for the, um, for instruction. So again, you're establishing routines, looking at, you, looking at how to use protocols, and again, a lot of anchor charts, norming a lot of the practices that are going to be, again, repeated throughout each of the modules as, it, as they progress throughout the year. So becoming a close reader and writing to learn. Researching to build knowledge and teach others. Uh, module three is considering perspectives and supporting opinions. And module four is gathering evidence and speaking to others. Go to the next slide. So this is the anatomy of a module. And what I did is I looked at the different things that are available in K through two and three through five, and I kind of put them together. Um, so just to give you some information. So each module is broken down into three units, and the number of lessons that are, are contained in each unit varies, but it's around 12 to 15 lessons that are available in each unit. The length of the modules uh, take eight to nine weeks. So, and I, I will say that uh, one thing that is suggested in order to, for this program is a, a lot of backwards planning. So you start with the end in mind, Mm -hmm. and you try to plan backwards to understand like what are the lessons, how are the lessons going to be sequenced throughout the year. Mm -hmm. And so looking at eight to nine weeks, that's why it's eight-ish to nine, eight to nine weeks. And then the K through two module one is shorter to allow for teachers to establish class routines and build relationships with students. And we know that those early learners are probably have a little, spend a little bit more time on that. And so the program allows for that. So that first module is probably about six weeks. And so the, the K through two module, each module begins with a story and guiding questions and big ideas. Now all the modules begin with a guiding question or big ideas. But in the grades three through five, it might be a poem. It might not necessarily be a story that starts off. And the highlights of each, each module is habits of character, you know, talking about per, you know, um, persistence and what are those things that we want our kids to, through the SEL practices, to develop as they're going through their learning. Again, it's a big focus on oral language, goal setting and reflection, having students set personal goals, learning goals through each one of the modules and be able to reflect on those learning goals after each lesson. We have access to rich, complex text. There's close reading, and, and when I say close reading, they actually provide, and this is something that we wanted to make sure that teachers had as we looked at the program, uh, of, uh, a manual for how to conduct that close reading. So that close reading takes place over a series of lessons, a progression, and it really guides the teacher through that. And then looking at the volume of reading, we want to make sure that our students have access to that complex, rich literature, different kinds of literature, so that each module comes with a suggested and recommended uh, uh, list of literature. There's a culminating performance task that's completed at the end of each uh, module and uh, there's a formative and summative uh, standards-based assessments that are also available in all the modules. Uh, there's writing for understanding, explicit EL instruction. So as you can see, and as you'll see in one of the, the sample lesson, that there's uh, recommendations for the teacher on how to make sure that the students who are um, uh, identified as EL learners are accessing the curriculum and the material. 
and I said at the bottom there's standards-based assessments. There's one per unit in K through two, and there's two per unit in grades three through five. And again, I'm not going to read each one of these, but this is the K2 through 2 unit level assessments. And it just, I wanted to add this because it, it gives you an idea of what the, the focus on is on uh, as they look at this, as you look at the assessments and what are the skills that are being assessed and how they're assessed. So we talked about universal design for learning. There's multiple ways that students receive instruction and multiple ways that they can provide how they have mastered a certain uh, standard. So um, they're, they're looking at, uh, addressing those multiple intelligences and making sure that all students are able to access the curriculum. And again, I want to highlight the, the scaffold, a, a lot of scaffolds uh, for the reading and the writing, which provide structure and, and a way for the teachers to really parse out how they're going to um, uh, sequence the lessons and how they're going to actually introduce those skills and how they build on each other. And then grades three through five, you'll see the unit level assessments as well. This gives you an idea of what the, what's being assessed and how they're being assessed. Okay. So this is a, uh, the next slide is a kindergarten sample lesson. And I picked it because if you look over here to my left, you see all the materials that we have and, and I've, I don't know if you've noticed, but throughout the year, you've seen this, our school committee room, because this has been like the headquarters for us reviewing the materials. So we've kept a lot of the materials here, and we've also ordered ones for each, each of the schools. Mm -hmm. So I want to just point that out in case you have any free time, you want to read through some of the ma uh, manuals, they're there for, for you, uh, so you can access. But I'm going to have uh, Dr. Holman, if you can, go to that. So I'm just going to, right here is a summary. So on the slide, there's a summary. But I'm going to have Dr. Holman click on lesson one, speaking, listening. And that's just going to give, oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> that's OK. So if you can type in. You want me to do yours? OK. So if you type I have in an account. I just Arlington <laughs> PS at example dot com and then the password don't tell anybody okay <laughs> it's highly confidential it's teacher <laughs> lowercase yes oh my goodness it worked awesome all right so this is a sample kindergarten lesson and so we're gonna go through this and like I said before as I was uh, giving you a description of the module of the lesson it starts off with the with the, a lesson um, a story excuse me and it it the one thing also I like about this program is that it provides a script for teachers teachers can use it or can they cannot use it it's up to the teacher but I would imagine that at the beginning is be very um, helpful for the teachers to have that script and as they become more familiar with the lessons in the program mm -hmm. that they'll be able to discard that script but it's there and again it could be utilized or not utilized so this is something that um, it provides as you see there in the bullets uh, some of the things that the teacher can refer to as they're talking to the students so it starts off giving the the the, the lesson target and it talks about the protocols that they're going to use, the picture tea, part, uh, protocol, tea party protocol. And then they watch a video. So these are some of the highlights that the teacher can um, use, some of the highlights that teachers can um, articulate to the students. And so as you go through the next, um, you, you read the story. They talk about the things that, the teach, that you're going to do in the lesson. And then so the learning target for lesson one is I can participate in a discussion with my classmates about weather and meteorolo meteorologists. So hold on, if you could slide, okay, go back up. Not That's sure okay. Where we're at. So right here is the mystery weather photos. Um, so here, this is where the knowledge building takes place. So you introduce the lesson, you introduce a story, you introduce the guiding question, you introduce the, t the target, um, the lesson target. 
and then the two guiding questions for this one, lesson one, module two, unit one, lesson one is what is weather? How can I be prepared for any type of weather? You read, you do the read aloud, and it's the, the name of the story is Curious Sophia. And so then, hold on, go back. Sorry. Uh, all right, so those highlights, so you had the read aloud, thank you very much. On the right hand side is the things that the teacher, right, having that metacognition for the teachers. So these are the things that they're going to think about as they're talking about the lesson. They ha and, and then in the manuals, they actually have a script that the teacher can refer to. So if you look at the right-hand side, you'll see that. So if you go, they read the story. Then as they're reading the story, they're having these questions. They may stop and ask these questions to the students. What do you see in this picture? As I read, think about uh, what Sophia, Sophia wanted to do. And then keep going. And then it continues to ask questions to the students as they're listening to the story so they can think about the things that they want the students to consider. So that's the story. So they, they complete the story. They start the lesson with the story. Then they stop. Okay, stop here. Go back up. What questions does Sophia ask about the weather? They were a review of the story. So again, they have these questions that they need to be answered. Right? And they're looking at and they're building that knowledge. They're building that, those guiding questions. They're setting the purpose for the lesson. So as they look at that, and then they, they have that graphic up there. We, we have you know, other cards that are, I'm sorry you can't see it because it's so far away, but this is, you'll be able to see it because when I give you the, the version that has the link that works, you'll be able to dive into it. So you go to next to the guiding question, what is There's weather? like a physical book, right, mm -hmm. that they have. Yeah. Like yeah. the teacher's like reading, are they reading like a book or are they reading the slides? Both. So we, we're going to purchase, there's going to be a, there's going to be a dashboard, a platform that teachers will be able to access and then we're going to have the hard copy. So this is the manual right here in my hands, module two, weather wonders. So this is the topic. So there's one of those for each module. For each there's module. one of these for each module. But like, but like, but like here, lesson. I'm like the like, I'm the kindergarten teacher, and yeah. I'm sitting in my classroom, right? And and I'm just trying to understand, like, am I like doing a read aloud? Yes, from it's this a read aloud. Book? Or are we like reading a slideshow? No, no, no. Okay. It's a read aloud. Okay. It's a read but aloud. From that, there's a it's, it's, there's a there's a um, supplemental book that's over there, can hold up, and it's supplemental materials in there. There are gorgeous picture books. Okay. Associated Thank with this. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay, we're they good. Are. Okay. Let, let me just say, like this. That's what I needed to hear. This this particular story, <laughs> but I want to be very clear. This particular story is in the manual, but. And when they go to lesson two, they get another text that they can read that's more, that's a nonfiction text. So some of the things that they read, like poems and songs, are located in the manual, module, but they do give you a list of books and texts that the kids can hold and you can read from as a teacher. So it's a mix of how they're presenting materials. Texts so, like yes. this, an example, as an example, would be used to teach a skill. And as part of a module lesson, and then they might then go read a, some set of supplemental texts during the all block that are book books, or they might have a small excerpt of text that they're doing a close read on, but then they'll go and engage with book books. So there will be a lot of book, book lots purchasing. of books, lots of materials. Okay. They're not all. Okay. It's like not all small. just like it's not it's not an anthology like a basil reader or anything like that. They're like authentic texts nonfiction and fiction text that that's kids will be able to put their hands on and they'll be able, be able to select from. Okay, did I, did I answer your question? Okay, perfect. Okay, so where was I? Okay, so you go back up. I'm sorry. We have the, um, right there, so we have the guiding questions. Okay, and then you can go. Thank you. So this is how we, we talk about accountable, tech, accountable talk. There's lots of protocols that are available in the program that the teacher can utilize in order to teach students how to uh, engage in peer-to-peer uh, -peer conversations. And they have other things like sentence starters so that the teacher will get the protocol. On this one, a picture tea party. And they use mystery weather, weather photos that are available in a supplemental. They're full color. And you can utilize those. You hand them out to the uh, students. And then if you go to the next one, 
you'll see like this is not this is not this is just a representation online but we do have actual the cards and the pictures of the weather and then you go to the next slide so you define I'm sorry you go back up you define what weather is you define the terms and then you go to the next And then you have, you know, kids engage in activities like how do you say weather in different languages? So you're trying to expose them to a multicultural piece. And so if you keep going. Again, you go you revisit the learning tar target because you want you're setting kids up in order to have discussions about weather. All right, keep going. Then you have a, 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 a poem that you introduce to students as they think about. Again, this is activating their schema, trying to get them into the habit of thinking about weather, what it's about, then keep going. This is a repeated thing too, this, this target poem. That's something they'll do repeatedly and there's like hand motions and arm motions that go with it that help the kids internalize the target. So with little kids, developmentally, it's exceptionally appropriate because it helps them understand this is what I'm learning today. So this learning target poem is something that's repeated, particularly for the younger grades. Can you There's just songs. read it out loud? Yeah, read the poem to us. <laughs> you want to read, read it? Read the, read, the, read the learning target poem, Rod. I'll read, poem. <laughs> I'll read it for you. Okay, learning target poem. So I'm going to have you think, right? So you're my kindergarten students, so you're gonna think you're going to say, what happens when two people have a discussion? You're going to take out your magic bows and you're going to take aim at the target while you recite the learning target poem out loud. Learning target poem. Think of the thing you desire to learn. Believe in yourself and your efforts will earn. The ability to learn, to learn something new. Now take your aim at the target true. I'm, I would have to look, I, I don't, it's not every lesson necessarily, but they get used to that as a routine. So one of the things this curriculum builds in are some of those routines so that they understand this is the part of the lesson I'm in and that gets repeated, which is good for their brains. Okay. So these are things that are, that are integrated into the lessons in order to, that are developmentally appropriate for early learners. Again, there's songs that are also in, that are, have been integrated in some of the lessons. And again, it's to activate their schema in order to get them involved, engaged into learning. So we go to the next, and this is the picture tea party protocol. So again, I wanna also emphasize that a lot of, in module one, you're putting together a lot of like anchor charts and you're norming how uh, students will engage with one another. You're setting like expectations and routines. You're hanging these art anchor charts around the room. This could be one of the anchor charts that you use in order to, this is one that they use in order to have students engage in a conversation <coughs> about weather. And this is where you use those photos. And then you, you're talking to students and, and you're um, introducing this protocol and you take them through this protocol that they're gonna utilize to have a discussion. So a lot of modeling, a lot of, uh, you know, in order to engage students. And so you'll, you would do this, you would model it for the students and then you would have them uh, try it out. Uh, and then you would go around the room with a checklist and you would listen in on the conversations that they're having and you would use the checklist that comes along with this in order to assess how each one of the students are participating in the discussion. And then you would be able to maybe work on some individual skills that, as, that you notice based on the checklist, either, either some th trends that you've noticed uh, that are going on with all of the students, or you would go back and maybe you can work on individual students in order to help them understand how to have the discussion. Or you, and using those checklists will help you to, to assess that activity. But I, I may have missed. Is the tea party like part of the story? Or is no. That it's, it's, the, it's the how, it's the pedagogy. Okay. Right. This is the protocol, right, this is the how, exactly. And, and that 
sort of tea party thing would extend throughout multiple units. Right, so right. you would introduce like an, all these all these modules build on each other. So you have a you you have these protocols that you can refer back to as you have students engage in conversations. So just like back to back is another protocol that at the kindergarten level that they introduce face to face. This is another protocol that you can utilize. And as you can see, at the top of this, there's sentence starters. So you would go through and you would use these center starters in order to have students to engage in conversations. And so like I said, a lot of the activities and the Laura. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. Appreciate that. Um, so those are the kind of things that, that are introduced. Because you don't want you don't want to just assume that students know how to engaged in a conversation. So we want to make sure that we're introducing protocols. And there's protocols for everything in this particular program. And so I, that's one of the things that we liked about it is because it's providing though, that direction, that modeling. And we're having students engage in these discussions and we're showing them how to do it and we're modeling it for them. I'd also like to know a lot of these protocols are designed with the explicit intention of embedding social emotional learning skills into the curriculum. So they they get that ac sort of academic belonging and confidence from sitting in a circle with peers and looking at a picture and saying, I see this, and so I think we're going to learn about this, and I wonder this. Um, and that builds their confidence to use the language that's in the unit so they can use it later when they're reading the text. They'll comprehend it. They'll build the vocabulary. So the next, if we go to the next part of the lesson, you, you can st st stop here as you're uh, showing out these Again, we're going back to the pictures because the, the, the Tea Party protocol is in conjunction with using these pictures, these weather pictures, that the students will look at. And as they look at the picture, they are making a prediction or they make a prediction bef uh, as what is happening in that picture as it relates to weather. Okay. So again, as you look th to the side, you see on the right, um, again, this is focused on, and then, and then this is a skill that they're working on because remember the lesson, the target, le the target learning target for the lesson is speaking and listening. So a lot of the activities that take place in this lesson are based upon having kid, having the students speaking to each other and listening to each other. So these are the pictures that they're looking pictures. at in the protocol. These are the pictures, exactly. So you go back and you reinforce. Okay, that was over there. Just show the pictures. Here we go. So right here, you reinforce. And then that, again, there's all kinds of conversation norms, anchor charts that are available. You see on the right hand side of the lesson. And these are things that the teacher will, these are things that you review before as you're developing the lesson that you'll have to understand how to do. So we go on to the next. Again, we're knowledge building. So the next part of this, remember the, the, we, we are talking about weather and meteorologists. What does a meteorologist do? And so like when you're introducing these vocabularies, you're also creating a word wall. And then we have picture cards that go along with the, the words. And then you're hanging up a word wall in your classroom. And so the first two uh, vocabulary words that you're going to introduce to students that's connected to the learning target is weather and meteorologists. And so as you're doing that, you're also phonetically going through and you're tapping it out. Kids through foundations will learn how to tap out words. They'll be able to go through and decode what the word is. And then based upon the science of reading, you're not only doing that, but you're also defining what that word means. So as you introduce these words, they're tapping out the words, they're understanding how to read the words. And so this part of it is providing uh, meaning. So you have a video of what a meteorologist does. I was going to have you watch the video, but that might be a too, mu too much. But that's also linked into the lesson. There's a, a link to a video of a meteorologist. Now what you can do in order to customize it is you can also, the teacher can also go to a local news network, like you know, look online, get the, the link to Channel 5 News, and see how we do here in Boston 
They could use, utilize that and access that. And so the one thing that you're doing, you're building that knowledge so students understand what a meteorologist do, does, okay? And so this part of it is that you are looking at this video and you're building that background knowledge. It also feels like you could bring in, you, know, you can have pictures of meteorologists from all over so that you can show that it's not just exactly one, you know, a white male or, you know, there, there can be people of all different races. Mm -hmm. And actually in the, in the video here, it is a, is it a African American uh, meteorologist that is uh, part of that video. But to your point, you can also, there's lots of extensions you can do from around the world. You can say, oh, and then in different languages. This is what it looks like in uh, various countries when they report on the weather. Because at the end, okay, remember, and this is where that back, backwards design comes in, at the end, the kids are gonna actually do, the, do this. So right now, you're building that background knowledge, and then at the end, they're gonna apply what they're learning at the end of this lesson. So this is your picture card for the vocabulary word. A meteorologist, scientist who studies the Earth's weather. So you would have that up you will put the picture card up on your word wall for weather and meteorologists. And so let's go to the next one. Are you? Okay, so right here, this is how you're gonna debrief and again, you're uh, constructing meeting. And so these are some of the questions that you'll ask the students after they watch, after they watch the video. What did you notice? What did you notice that the meteorologist was doing? And then this is where you can have that, those protocols come into play, where they have back-to-back -back and face-to-face, -face, and you can have an anchor chart. Remember how we had our discussions in Module 1? Remember these protocols that we introduced in Module 1? You're introducing them again, and they're circling around, and they're going to have conversations with one another about what they noticed in the video. And so that, that's the one thing that they're focusing on, the learning target, is speaking and listening. And then that's when the teacher can go around again with their checklist to check in on those conversations. Okay, so I'm going to just jump because I don't want to, I want to, don't take up all the time. So right here is in the assessment, if you go down to the interactive writing, introducing the class weather journal. So now students have gone through this background knowledge building, they've introduced the vocabulary, you've had a story about weather, and now they're going to, uh, do their own, uh, you're going to introduce the classroom weather journal. Again, it's, it's scaffolding this. There's a template for it. Then you, again, revisit. You have this question. And then you go on. And then this is what they have in their own workbooks. They'll have a template. And then they'll report. They'll look outside and they'll report on the weather. And so they'll, you know, they'll go through, talk about the date. You have the pictures, and then you have at the bottom of that, you have that sentence that they have to fill out um, and be able to report on what the weather conditions are for that day. That's a sample of lesson one. So we can go back to the slide deck and I can finish up. That's just one lesson. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Is that f over one day? That's over that's, one day. That's one, mod that's one module lesson also. That's not one the module. all block, skill block, or labs. So yes. I also want to note that, like, <laughs> there is a script. There is one. There is a script. It is not our expectation. It, it is absolutely our expectation that teachers are building in relevant examples from our students' lives and following them through this, and not that they use the script. But it's useful to have when you have a brand new teacher to a curriculum, right. brand new teacher to a classroom, substitute teacher, that, that, that they can implement the lesson because that does exist. And when you're stuck, you can go back to that. Like, what? how is this supposed to be connected to that? And it can help you understand how it's intended to be connected to that. But one of the things we're telling our staff is that this offers so many opportunities for creativity and tapping into uh, local meteorologists or like literally what's the weather outside today and having deeper discussions that get kids really excited and curious, that that's part of why this is the selection. Um, so. I, I want to note that because I don't, it, I don't want the expectation to be that this get, that you walk from one classroom to another classroom, you're seeing the exact same thing happen. We don't want automatons. That is not what this is about, um, and that's not why we selected this curriculum. Quite the contrary, we selected it because it offers so many opportunities to tap into the relevancy of our local community, um, and 
to, to build out and expand upon for students who are ready to take another step or go a little bit deeper. So um, as we, as, and, and as, as teachers become more familiar with the curriculum, I'm sure that they, they will be able to internalize some of this and they will be able to do this um, without the script. Some teachers, like I said, will use it and some teacher, teachers will not. But there, there is, as Dr. Holman said, there is um, um, opportunities for creativity. So, um, and I, and I want to say that the skills, the, 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 the recommended time for the uh, module lesson, that was just a lesson, is 60 minutes. So you have 60 minutes, and as you can see on the side, it had recommended times for, when, for how long each section of the lesson would take, okay? And there's like, there's also movement in there. It's not, and this is not kids just sitting down. As you saw in there, they're having uh, discussions with one another up. There's multiple um, modal ways that they can show their learning. They can dance. They can actually act out what a meteorologist uh, does in their discussion. So it's not just kids sitting down and receiving this. There's, there's lots of activities so they are active. So I don't want anybody to think that um, this whole lesson, kids are just sitting there um, and just listening. There, there's lots of... Uh, uh, movement, there's lots of discussion, uh, they can act out, they can choose different ways that they want to express their learning. So what are the next steps for us uh, for the implementation of the program? So uh, one thing that, a couple of things that we've already done, we've had a couple of meetings with the representatives from Imagine Learning in order to talk about the information they need in order to purchase the materials. Um, we also already have planned um, uh, professional learning for our literacy coaches, uh, uh, elementary principals, we have special educators, we have our ELL director, they're all gonna get this first round of PD for both grade bands, K2 and 3-5. So we have a three hour uh, session plan for all of those individuals to start learning the curriculum. Um, we put together a interdisciplinary team uh, again, people from different roles that include principals, special education, EL uh, director. Um, and so in order for us to come together, in order to understand what we need to do in order to roll this out in a very uh, strategic and effective manner. Um, and so a large part of that is providing the professional learning and support, the ongoing support that teachers will need going into next year. Uh, and then we're gonna look at our daily instructional schedule the program offers examples of how you can structure your day so that you can fit the modules and all the literacy instruction in along with other things. And I want to emphasize this because this is something that I want to make sure that I'm representing all content areas, that we're also looking at like the impact that it will have on math instruction. We want to make sure that we don't uh, decrease the amount of math instruction. And we also want to make sure that we're also planning for explicit social studies and science instruction, even though these are dis interdisciplinary units and include social studies and science topics. They do, but they don't cover all of the standards. So right now, our directors of science and social studies are, have started creating curriculum maps that align with the module lessons. And so that's the summer work that's going to happen as we move forward and into next year. So I, 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 I would be remiss if I didn't uh, list all the individuals that are part of the district core team. As uh, Dr. Holman stated, this has been a year-long process that has included lots of conversations. I want to thank Dr. Darcy Burns, the executive director of Hill for Literacy, who has been there and been a thought partner for myself and uh, Deb Perry and Allison Elmer, who are co-chairs of the, uh, along with me with the district core team. So it's been a lot of um, discussions. And one thing I think that this process has done, it's elevated our, our discussions amongst teachers about what is best practice for literacy instruction. We've uh, done, and we've added that into our um, professional, uh, district-wide professional learning series that we have going on in order to support the different instructional shifts that we're gonna have to make in order to adopt EL education. So we go to the last slide, which has the resources on there. These are all live links. We're going to make sure that uh, anybody can link to this. And if they want to dive into other uh, grade levels, other modules, other lessons, they can do so. And then there's also an article about the, the science of reading. We have the program review tool in there and the link to the uh, EL Education and Publisher Roundtable that took place. We recorded it so anybody can access it who didn't have a chance to uh, attend. And with that, that ends my presentation.
So, and now I open it up for comments and questions. So before I do questions, I just want to thank Dr. McNeil for creating the part of the presentation which was about the lesson, which he did since about four o'clock this afternoon. Mm, yep. So he pulled that together really quickly at my request, and I do appreciate it because I think this is a huge decision, and I think we should know what we're getting with it. And also, I wanted the parents who you know, are millions of watchers out <laughs> <laughs> um, have an idea. And it, it, this also gives us something that we can refer people back to, too, about you know, what's coming and how does it look different. And I think this was really helpful for me, at least, and, and I hope for some of you. So does anyone have any? Um, so, um, I'm, so as the parent of a current kindergartner, watch, and I've subbed in kindergarten, it was like really helpful for me to see the example. But one thing I would just think as we go forward with this, that I think will alleviate some anxieties among parents of of the kids in these early learning classes is to emphasize perhaps a little more strongly that the Hegarty and Foundation's work that their kids have started doing and that you know I've personally seen with my own kindergartner like have really worked um, that 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 we're trying we're we're we're, we're going to start this new thing it's exciting there's going to be you know we don't know exactly what the implementation is but those phonics like fundamentals are, we're not like playing with those right now. That's, because I don't think people, I'm not sure that people know that or, you know, assume that, I think there's sort of a feeling like, oh, we're about to like, like change it all up. So I think emphasizing that will help with um, just especially the, the, the kindergarten and first graders. I mean, I don't know, obviously you haven't figured out yet what the implementation plan is. So I think communicating about that is also going to be really important because I've, I've already been asked, like, you know, is, is it all, you know, is every kindergartner next year getting the new curriculum? Is Tools of the Mind, like, gone? You know, sort of what people want and are curious about how this is going to look. And I know you can't answer that today, but just the communication around that. Once we have our implementation plan, we will make sure that it's a uh you know, we definitely communicate it out to everyone, and I will continue to emphasize that. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. Any, like, so what's the, how does this work with tools in, at kindergarten? Like, are we, like, what are, what's the vision when we, when, I mean, I, I, some of the sort of, as we move our way back to getting to kindergarten with this, are, like, are we keeping tools of the mind? No. no. So, no tools in mind, just this. The sharks yes. are gone. Huh? The I'm sorry, sharks. yes. The scary sharks. Oh, yes, the, uh, okay. the magic tree house. Jack and Annie. Jack and Annie, yes. Can I also a speak to... conversation too. here about the sharks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. sure. Let's look. Um, there were earlier conversations that where we were thinking about how to roll this out effectively, and I think some of our current thinking is not that we move backwards. Okay. Um, so I just... I, we're still working out exactly what we're thinking we're going to do, but we, it, it, our approach is probably going to be start with the coalition of the willing, the people who are really ready to jump in with two feet. Um, so that could look a little bit different and keep teachers in teams working together on this in the first year, um, and that will form the implementation plan. But it's not looking like we're going to go okay. backwards at this point. Okay. I, I, that's Okay, so I I'm wanted to be... I think this is a great work, and I thank Dr. McNeil and everyone who worked on this. This is a lot of time and effort, and it looks like it was very thoroughly done mm -hmm. and very thoroughly researched, so you all should be commended for that. Thank you. So good work. Um, that's what I wanted some clarity, but I was confused by the phase-in. Mm -hmm. I think you answered it, and I wanted to understand, like, the professional development training the teachers were going to get to get ready for this. Mm -hmm. and, and is your vision um, so fall of... 20, fall of 24, it's it's all going to be used by everybody, all, all grades, so a year from so September? So myself, Dr. McNeil, and Dr. Ford Walker are very closely working with the implementation team, which is a cross-role group, yep. to answer for ourselves that very question. Okay. Um, what is it, what kind of supports would we need for those, we, we have teachers who are ready to jump in with two feet, they're like, let's do this fall 23, 
how many we're, we're they're developing a survey right now to figure out exactly how many of those are out there and whether we have full grade level teams that are going to commit to some summer work paid um, to get onboarded and then really jump in um, we want to make sure that that's that cannot be obviously everyone because our coaches really need to work closely with the grade level teams that do it and how many folks are out there that are saying I want to try a module next year but not go full in um, and then where people are with a full implementation maybe fall 24 maybe through 24 with a full implementation fall 25 we want to be we want to take advantage of the fact that there's a lot of enthusiasm right now people are excited about it and acknowledge and respect the fact that these are big instructional shifts that mm -hmm. dr. McNeil just showed you um, and that takes time to learn how to work with protocols and to do knowledge building and to deal with spiraled standards where you hit this and you're going to come back to it later in the year. So we're do, we're on a, I'm on a listening tour right now. I'm going to every single school and listening to the faculty and talking to them about what the shifts are um, and how this is aligned with deeper learning. And at the end of May, we will have a final implementation plan. Okay. So I mean, tonight we're approving the curriculum. Mm -hmm. Correct. And then you're going to work on some of these details, mm -hmm. and then there's going to be a rollout communication to parents, including explaining when to Tools of the Mind is phased out. Yes. In that. early June, we should have the full implementation plan and cost out for next year. Okay. That is the next question. Did, is there, um, like, is there anything we should know about the cost of all this? It's expensive. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, that's it good. Is <laughs> okay. We, is yes. It, yeah. Okay. Maybe that's all we need to know. It's in the budget. We've Maybe. spent hundreds of thousands on texts for years, and right. some of those texts we'll keep because they're aligned with these topics. Yeah. Um, and others of them we'll cease using, and we'll start purchasing more texts. But we have a line in the budget for this, um, and we have additional funds that we can use towards this in our SR three. Yeah, dollars. The funds. Okay. Yep. Okay. Those extra funds. Okay. And it's in the strategic plan. Yeah, it is. No, I know it is. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Um. We we have uh, like I said, they have a, a list of required and recommended text. Yeah. So I am going to work with uh, our director of digital learning and libraries, Rashmi Pimpakar, and we are going to do a cross reference to see exactly what are the recommended texts and how many that we have that we need to purchase. We're, we're, it's a foregone conclusion we're going to buy all the required text, but we're going to look at the recommended text and see what we already have, because we have spent a, a, a lot of money on building up classroom libraries, and we want to be able to continue to access those libraries mm -hmm. for our students. Well, I mean, this is something we should be spending a lot of money on. I think mm -hmm. this is pretty fundamental to what yeah. right. we do in education. So this is, I'm, I'm all for spending money on this. So mm -hmm. um, my final question is, I don't know when the tools of the mind conversation took place, but we had a nice conversation and then there was a group that came to us and, and they were not in agreement, including some internal staff. I'm just, I'm, I'm sure there were uh, thoughtful conversations among all the staff. Is there, was there alignment on this curriculum at the end of the day? I mean, you made the final decision that you're, you're, you're charged with doing, but I'm kind of just wondering, was there a consensus? What was it like inside the room with all the folks involved? I, so passionate, yeah. I'm sure. I mean, I hope it was. Well, yes, but I think I think uh, based upon the, the work and the and the research that we've done and the training we've done in, over the last couple of years, I I, I want to say that teachers knew that this was coming yeah. because we did the work around the science of reading. Mm -hmm. We understood that our current program does not align mm -hmm. with the thinking that goes into the science of reading. So we've done the professional learning around it. And yes, you might have some teachers to say they wanted to keep units of study or tools of the mind. Mm -hmm. But overall, I think that the the understanding is that we were going to uh, adopt a new literacy program okay. and i think that uh as as we get closer and closer to i mean now that we're actually doing it i haven't heard any uh, uh you know people pushing back and like holding on with to like no i want to keep tools of the mind um and we've we've had lots of discussions about it so i think people knew that this was coming yeah. And so they're prepared. I, I would say that they're prepared and they know that this is going to take place. It does sound like it was well set up. It was a good process. Everyone had a say in it. At the end of the day, it was clear you guys, leadership was going to make a decision based on right. feedback and input. So good. Okay. I'm going to vote yes as soon as we get the motion on the table. Okay. Any Thank more you. questions? Mr. Cardin? No? Mr. Schlegel. Okay. 
Mr. Fritzen. Yeah, I, I, I think that most of my questions have been answered through the pro but as, a, as an educator, an elementary educator, I'm really interested in the process of phasing it in mm -hmm. uh, because early adopters is a great way to do it, but then you know you have to make sure the kids who have entered through the early adopters are able to continue as they move up up the grade levels and my sense in watching this is this thing is spiraled enough so that getting kindergarten in early is sort of the w seems to be a priority and if we were going to hit two grades as a priority because of the natural shift uh, starting at K and three and and, and working up but uh, I'm impressed with the fact that we've got ESSER funds right now because that's great for one-time purchases and getting into this curriculum is a one-time purchase. But I, I think that the thinking behind literacy curriculum right now is so different than like when I was a kid in the kindergarten, we were barely hitting Dick, Jane, and Sally, and now we got meteorologists and I, I I know they can do it I know kids can do this because I had preschool kids sitting on trapezoids in their classroom uh, the only danger is is that uh, by the time you hit December or January you're gonna have about 500 critics of the superintendent's decision for snow days <laughs> 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 but this, this is impressive and I, I and, and I'm gonna be pleased to vote for this thank you very much okay. any further questions Okay, you've already answered mine mm -hmm. with the presentation. I appreciate that. Thank um, you. So do I have a motion to approve? I move approval of the, the curriculum as presented. Second. Any further comments? All in favor? I mean, we need a roll call because Mr. Cardin Oh, you're is, right, you're uh, right. Okay, roll call vote. Mm -hmm. Ms. Goodelson? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Okay, Ms. <laughs> Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Thoman? Yes. Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. And I also vote yes. Can I say a couple words? Please. Oh, yeah. Dr. McNeil, as your parting work for the <laughs> students of the Arlington <laughs> Public Schools, I, there's very little I can say that expresses the gratitude that I have for how much effort you have given mm -hmm. this, how many people's voices you have made sure will be heard in this process, your advocacy for the needs of all of the people involved in its implementation, and the thoughtfulness with which you've put this process together. This is an amazing legacy to leave mm -hmm. to Arlington's students, um, and we'll miss you next year, but thank you. Thank you very much. But we'll thank see you, you next week. Ne at our next You're couple of meetings. Next <laughs> <laughs> You're not excused. You're not yeah. excused. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay. So next we have the monthly financial report, Mr. Mason. Am I driving for you? Yes, because okay. this computer is. Yes, uh, I got it. Oh, my legs. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Holman, and. Uh, Good evening, school committee members. It's hard to follow up with that last presentation. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, um, what I will say is that if track in the playoffs, the Celtics are winning, so. Oh. Uh, all right. <laughs> um, so tonight I'm presenting you the finan monthly financial reports for um, Period 10, but not exactly period 10. It's, it's financial reports as of May 9th. So it's the most recent financials that uh, I could provide at the time. Um, and I'm going to go a little detail in terms of explaining um, some of the reports for those that may not um, have been exposed to some of the reports previously. But um, we have a few reports that are included, which is a general fund report, which is report of the town appropriation. Um, there's the grant financial report, and there are the special revenue and revolving report. And so each of those reports, um, they report by object code, which is the description of expense. Um, that it usually includes, for the general fund, is a category of a, or a column that says the original budget which is the original uh, sum of object uh, some of the, all the budgets for that object code um, 
then there is an adjusted column based on some adjustments that are between the current budget accounts, which leads to a revised budget amount. There's then the actual, which is the actual expenditures um, as of the date of the, the, in the, of the finances in our financial system, as well as the encumbrances is what we've approved um, to be spent. So encumbrances could be salaries that are yet to be paid out that we know of um, and that are budgeted and or you know, contracts that we've established with outside vendors or procurements. And then projected expenses, normally, you know, um, every period before April, um, it's a formula um, based on assuming departments will spend down their funds and it includes some holding for some vacant positions. Um, now that we're at the end of the year, as, you know, there's <coughs> not likely that we're gonna be filling these vacant positions um, and there are more you know, tuned, like tuned in to spending that we do anticipate to happen um, until June 30th, in which then nets out to a projected balance. And so we are projecting a balance at the end of this uh, to be around $77,000. Um, this is once again an estimate. I wouldn't use it as, um, you know, a hard number to go by, but um, there is we're in the black, so that's good. Um, that's an approximate, right? Not yeah. it, a minus on yeah. the seven. Yes, that's, that's a, an okay. approximate. It's a tilt. That is yeah. not a deficit or <laughs> anything like in. that. And I, I, I just don't want to give an exact number, right? So just um, and there's still expenditures that that have no, not been right. identified, you know, and projects that um, that we need to work on. So we can go down into the next slide, which explains the expending. Um, the darker maroon is the actual spending um, versus um, for each budget category where then there's a lighter gray there that's the encumbered amounts that's remaining till the end of the year. And then if there's black, that means that there's money left in that particular category. And some others are a little overspent, which um, in the encumbrances, which will, uh, talk about future budget transfers with the budget subcommittee and then propose in the final meeting our final budget transfers. You go to the next slide. Um, this is just our total um, spending for the general fund um, by month uh, with the black line as the, um, the total um, cumulative for the year at this point. And so uh, at this point we are at um, about $63 million in total spending. Um, you go to the next slide. So there, I, well, that's not good. Um, Topic, topic. Yes. No, spammers. Yes, it was actually, it was a spammer. Um, they just knew I was right in this point in the meeting. Mm. Um, so the next slide is, there was uh, some questions that was uh, provided uh, before the, the meeting, which is always greatly appreciated so that I can focus in on certain items that uh, may need clarification. Um, one a line or object code um, was asked about, it was about around student activity support, support stipends and about why the spending was so high. And I, I do wanna just remind, um, like, you know, the philosophy in terms of how the budget is, is, is set up is, that every program and cost center, you know, there are line items in the budget and there's like a bottom line number that every department head works to. Mm -hmm. And the lines may not necessarily always align um, based on what they've identified as what they're intending to spend in a particular year. Um, and, uh, and sometimes when they do submit the actual payments, their classification is actually incorrect, and so therefore the business office corrects that. And so when looking at the budget versus actual, um, we, we, we were at one point adjusting entries and doing transfers, and then we actually slowed down on those because we, you know, of a request to make sure that we are providing transfers in advance of, of um, between different categories uh, to, the, to the school committee. So um, what I will say is that the student activity support stipends are actually not 
um, high. So if you look at this, this is up till 2017, we use this object code, and this is reflecting the data of um, actual spending, which you'll see is in blue, and then encumbered, which is only for fiscal 23, um, which is in black. And so you'll see that actually our student activity support stipend where we're projecting to end is actually lower than fiscal 22. All right. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, this is um, just a question in, in terms of, you know, what are other stipends? Um, so the other stipends is like a catch-all. Um, there are various different type of expenses that could go in. This include project stipends. Um, this includes school committee stipends that were recently funded this year. Um, and um, various overtime payments. So just wanted to provide clarity on that. Um, if you go to the next slide. Um, one of our biggest, and I, I spoke about it in a previous presentation, is you know power elect uh, electricity power um, for our buildings. And you know this year utilities, I mean our supply agreements are, um, you know we we have negotiated supply agreements. The high school was not originally the newer the new phase, the first phase um, in the whole new building is going to be on one meter, but it wasn't negotiated. And so part of this year, we were paying market rent rate uh, utilities for the electricity. Um, at some point, I don't know that exact date, it, it, it did switch, but then you have to consider that that building is mainly using electricity to maintain temperatures in the building. Um, so that's why we are seeing increases, along with the increases on the delivery charges. That is uh, a lot of, you know, residential homes are seeing that, as well as uh, the same thing, like we're a business, we, we are seeing those type of increase in expenses. So, but with that, cons with knowing that that's a concern, um, what you'll see is that there's about a $600,000 that's gonna be transferred and put onto building rentals at the end of the year to make sure we budget our, our balance our budget. And um, you'll see that there's a gray a line here in this slide which represents what we're currently budgeting for fiscal 24 and the current budget that the school committee approved and that got approved at town meeting. Um, and so we are pretty good and we anticipate that with the new rates and the, the, the next rate change will actually have the high school at a lower rate mm -hmm. than what we're currently paying mm -hmm but it's still higher than what we had previously negotiated. So, um, but we anticipate that we'll have sufficient funding for next year. If we go to the next slide, um, uh, it was, uh, there was a question about uh, custodial supplies cleaning and, and why it might have been higher. It, once again, that's a bottom line budgeting thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, we're actually in line, fiscal 21, uh, you know, you'll see that it had a, a big uptick because of COVID. So we, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, so professional tech services in terms of increased spending. Um, this year, I, I don't know, I, I will come back to the committee um, in regards to more details in regards to this. This does seem like there's been an uptick. Um, and it's likely due to contracted services within facilities. Um, so we have not been able to fill um, HVAC positions in facilities. And so you'll see in the line by the object report, there's about $200,000 uh, available on the maintenance salaries. But HVAC, uh, HVAC contracted services, maybe I'm, actually maybe I'm speaking, I could be speaking off, but um, I will, Definitely double check and low battery, here we go. Um, I, d I definitely wanna do some more di diving in, um, but I think we have, these are definitely outside vendors that we've contracted out. All right. Last but not least, um, in terms of instructional materials, once again, bottom line budgeting does not mean that it was, that they're, it just means that the, the, the items are not aligned. And we're in about around where we spent last year. Um, for fiscal 23, if we include the encumbrances and where we're gonna end up at. Some, some follow-up questions, if you go to one more slide. 
which is under, there were some other questions in terms of contract transportation. You know, I, I didn't want to provide anything on this yet because I definitely want to look at, um, I've seen some charges in terms of some foster uh, transportation. Um, that seems like there's some additional uh, homeless transportation this year that, um, that, that I wasn't necessarily aware of. So I just want to confirm some of that data. Um, but that's um, mainly the uptick in contractor transportation, not necessarily is tied to out of district contractor transportation. And then some of the capital expenditures, um, there were some cafeteria tables at the Gibbs, um, repairs for the bracket school at the bracket school um, playground that was included in the current expenditures. But then what's, what um, is in the projected are some projects which include the, um, we're doing an Audison projector project for end of year spending, um, Hardy projectors and some projectors for the Audison Media, Media Center. Um, and these are projects that uh, definitely will make the space, make the instructional experience for those spaces great. So I think, uh, I think that wraps, is there anything else after this I think? I think that wraps it up. Um, the grant and revolving funds I did not include in this presentation, but they're in the memo. Um, spending is expected besides the electricity costs of, you know, being a little higher, and that's gonna be covered off of building rentals, and we have the funds there, so I'll open up to any questions and defer to the chair. Ms. Morgan. So so that I can understand, so I'm, I'm reconciling the email with the PDF and all the mm -hmm. boxes, right? And then the, the graph, like the, the presentation and the, the slides. So you're, the take home here is that you're, you're explaining to us why, so for example, um, custodial supplies, right? Um, so you're explaining to us that the, the actual spending is in line with what we've done historically, but perhaps the reason that we're seeing some big, bigger, very big positive or negative numbers on that right hand projected balance is that we maybe didn't get the left hand original budget right. Is that kind of the narrative here on some of these? So what I will say is that the the budget on like so this is custodial supplies, right? Sure. If you I start that. with that. What is that like? Gloves. Like cleaning supplies, okay. chemicals. Right. You know. Super. Great. Okay. Anything yep. that the custodian. Yeah, mops, it could be anything, um, paper. Um, <clears throat> so if you look, there were transfer outs within the facilities line items there. If you, if you see there, there was a reduction in the original budget. So the original budget was actually higher. At some, times it, at some, point, at some point in time, we reduced it internally along with the facility. But only by $194. Adjustments only. Let me double, let me make sure if I'm... It's 18904. Correct, you're right. When I was looking at it earlier, I was looking at um, some of the closing out of encumbrances last year. So, um, yeah, so that, yeah, exactly. So, you, correct. So, those numbers were lower because of the lines were not necessarily adequately funded. But that was also to cover the electricity costs. We knew that there was that in order to balance this, you know, I had to reduce some of the lines in when I was developing the budget last year to fund facilities. Facil facilities overall increased substantially. But working with the facilities director, them pu putting in what they were requesting for what they wanted for lines, and then overall I had to make some adjustments to make the budget balance. Some lines were reduced at the end of the day. So okay, even and and didn't take into consideration necessarily. I mean, because like if you if you look at the the if you look at eight two nine oh four, you're like, holy moly, what'd you people spend one hundred and forty thousand dollars on? Right. But then when you go over to the bar graph, yep. you're like, well, you spent what you did last year. So like you're clearly not stockpiling. Correct. Clorox, <laughs> Correct. right? So that's good. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So, but it, it's it's that we're we're going to continue to sort of dial in that original budget yes. number, so that, so that, that the so that what we because I mean to me 
When I look at 140,000, I think you're stockpiling Clorox. And then when I look at your bar graph, I'm like, well, I guess you're not. So I, the, the more that we can dial in that original budget column, um, that'll be great. Okay, super, that makes sense. That all of these, these all make sense to me, given that context. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any more, Mr. Schlickman? The only question I have is, is it going forward when, because we're showing electric costs uh, changing in this building because we're building a building that's dependent on electricity. As we demolish, I would assume then our gas costs are going down. Correct. So that if we're talking about our increased electric cost, it might make sense as we talk about this next year and we start tearing down where mm -hmm. we're sitting that the we're also showing uh, gas expenditures in this building as well. Correct. Yeah, Correct. okay. So we'll want to look at utilities as a yeah. mm -hmm. together. Yeah, we, okay. we, we do have some analysis. Uh, we've worked on that, and we're starting to see that some of the delivery charges mm -hmm. are muting the savings. Yeah. So some of, like, so it's been beneficial mm -hmm. that as we're phasing out some of the parts of the high school that it's overall helping the budget, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, we're, we're continuously monitoring that. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's only, we can only um, do this, like, you know, make sure that we have the right budgeted amounts mm -hmm. so long that our projections are good. So as we add more equipment, you know, whether that's ventilation to mm -hmm. different buildings, that means that more energy is being used mm -hmm. um, throughout the district, and that then becomes more difficult for Talia Fox, the sustainability manager for the town, to then do projections that are more accurate um, than along with the other changes that are on the delivery side. We can only control what we negotiate mm -hmm. on the, the yeah. supply yeah. side. Uh, understood, but I mean, it, it just uh, complete, you know, completes the rest of the picture. If we're talking about mm -hmm. increasing electric costs because of we're going into an all-electric building, uh, we should uh, also pair that with what's happening on the on the natural gas side. That's all. Yep. It, you know, I, I'm I'm not concerned about it, but I think it's, it's sort of an interesting point, and yeah. because it's brought up, yeah, yeah, I, I'd like chapter two of the story. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any more questions, Mr. Carden? No. Okay. So I just want to say the questions were brought to you by me wearing my Mr. Hainer hat because I felt we needed mm -hmm. someone to be asking questions of the budget. Um, so moving on, superintendent's update. Great. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I have a few updates for you this evening. Um, first of all, happy teacher appreciation week. We've been celebrating our educators and our nurses because teacher or Nurse Appreciation Day was yesterday, School Nurse Appreciation Day, um, with lots of love from our PTOs and snacks and breakfasts and stuff. So um, thank a teacher this week, please. Uh, congratulations to AHS student uh, Gosha Lubachev is a semifinalist for the U.S. Department of Education's Presidential Scholar Program. He is among 11 other uh, finalists in the state of Massachusetts, and uh, we're very proud of that accomplishment. It's really uh, very, very exciting, and there will be celebrations and press releases about this uh, coming. Congratulations to Linda Corrala, a hardy crossing guard at Lake and Brooks, who was named the Massachusetts School Crossing Guard of the Year, which is awesome. Um, congratulations to Linda. We were so excited that we got out a little bit ahead of the state um, in sharing this information, but it's at this point been shared on the Hardy PTO page and everybody's been um, expressing their congratulations for it. There will be a press release on this as well that we'll be sure to share out. Uh, we're so proud of her and grateful for her long-standing service and ensuring that our Hardy students get to school safely every single day. Isn't there an event tied to this? Yes, there's yeah. an event tied to this as well. I believe at the State House, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll have more details as we get them. Uh, I have a brief update, um, and it's possible Mr. Thielman will speak to this as well, uh, but we have messaged out about the high school phase two move schedule. Um, Arlington High School, so the move schedule was moved out um, to October, into October, and we've told everybody about those delays. A couple of notes about sort of how that impacts programming is that Arlington High School will have some early release days in mid-October, around the 16th and 17th, in order to accommodate um, the actual move itself, get the movers into the building while students aren't there, 
um, and they will move the in the afternoon through the evening. So part of the reason for the early release is that they need an extensive elongated period of time to actually get things from one building to another. Um, and so well, they'll release midday and then they'll work through the evening um, to do those moves on those two days. We'll have some rolling blackout days by discipline to allow the teachers to unpack and set up their classrooms. So there will be one day per department and depending on which department moves, say a uh, department moves on the 16th um, after the early release through that evening and it's the uh, ELA department, then the next day the students wouldn't have an ELA class. And then the next day, maybe on the 17th, the history department moves, the students who have a history class that next day wouldn't have a history class that day. So it should, it won't even impact all students because not all students have every discipline every day um, to be missing that class, but that's the way we're gonna be able to accommodate this without the three-day weekend. Originally, the move was planned for a three-day weekend. Um, now that it's not, we need to make a couple of adjustments to timing. Uh, students, teachers, and central office should be fully moved in and operational on October 19th according to this new timeline. I also wanted to let everybody know that Arlington is, Public Schools is working on partnering with Cartwheel Care to offer referral and emergency telehealth services for Arlington Public Schools students. This is very similar to the interface partnership that we've had. The biggest difference is that Cartwheel offers actual real-time um, sort of uh, buffer services. So like if you are having trouble, you're, you've done a referral and you're having trouble getting access to a permanent health care provider, uh, that uh, Cartwheel Care will fill in the gap with some telehealth services so we can get students immediate support if they need it um, and not need to wait for the referral service to actually link a student up with services. So uh, we are, this will be replacing Interface, um, which, was, which had gotten a lot of use during the pandemic as a referral service, but our usage had gone down pretty significantly. Um, and so this seems like a really great uh, uh, service for us to use and they've had a lot of success in other districts and we're excited to be partnering with them. Few updates on administrative hiring searches. We have a few of them happening. Um, we have uh, announced the Bishop and Bracket principals. Congratulations to Eva Liner and congratulations and welcome to Dr. Gretchen Weiss, the new uh, principal at Bracket, who I understand will be beginning her transition work very, very soon um, and hiring a new assistant principal very, very soon as well. Uh, our Director of Communications and Family Engagement has completed its final round with an announcement coming early next week. We're working on reference checks right now. Our Director of Research Data and Accountability had their initial interviews this week, right, Dr. McNeil? Uh, Dr. McNeil and Margaret Creedle thomas our Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, Belonging and Justice, is, are running that search together. Um, our Assistant Director of High School Counseling has an offer accepted with an announcement coming soon. Um, our Director of SEL and Counseling also has an offer accepted with an announcement coming soon. I'll probably um, be sending that out tomorrow morning. Uh, assistant Director of Finance is in the final round. Yes, and looking like an announcement before long. And assistant principal ships at Bishop and Brackett, that posting has closed, had a very deep pool of applicants for both schools, um, and we'll be doing initial interviews. They'll be planning those so that we can sort of um, have efficient efforts in those two searches between those two principals. Um, and, oh, and the Stratton search uh, is posted, is posted for another week and a half, I think. Um, and then they will, the interviews will launch. I've met with the Stratton faculty um, about sort of what they're looking for in their next principal. The process will launch. Um, we have community members who have volunteered to participate in that. I'm working with the school council on a family forum. Um, we'll do the initial search the last week of May uh, and the final round in the last couple days of May and into the first week of June. And we should have an announcement at the end of that first week of June. So that's for Stratton principal and your enrollments are in your packet. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Any questions? Hi, Jody. Um, this is actually normally Dr. Allison Anthony's question, but um, I'm just looking at the Thompson numbers for first and second grade. And I guess my question there is, is there space in the building to add a section? That's the challenge with this one. Um, mm. Hold on one sec, let me pull them up. So the answer to that is no, not without taking away the multi-purpose space, mm -hmm. which is used for PE classes that would otherwise be huge in the gym. Um, and so, and I've spoken with uh, uh, Ms. Donato ex pretty extensively about this, and we're thinking about what solutions to this would be, including adding a service provider. Um, 
per grade level and piloting some work that would allow us to work on some co-teaching. Um, and we are not set on whether or not that will be a way that we can use one of those floating roles to alleviate some of this pressure. Um, if we are going to alleviate this pressure, I would love to do so with a licensed educator in some way. Um, but it may not be that that is, it's, it would be to reduce the ratio of student to teacher, but not necessarily the section size. So. Okay, yeah. thank, thank you. Those numbers are creeping up. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? No? Okay. Thank you very much. Moving on. Um, so approval of senior award letters, uh, the E. Nelson Blake Jr. Book Award letter and the Ida Robinson Ida Robbins Scholarship for 2023 award letter. So those are both in Novus and you've seen them. They are not available to the public. I did check because we're not supposed to be telling people before it comes out. Mm -hmm. um, so I need a motion to approve them as they were presented to us, but we're not going to so mention the names. Second. Any further discussion? Okay, roll call vote. Ms. Goodelson? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. And I also vote yes. Mr. Cardin's sent getting awfully dark. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Are you okay, Lance? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> We're getting to the end. Okay, consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted with one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Warrant number 23250, 600 and yeah, six hundred and two thousand five hundred and seventy-four dollars and thirty-five cents from May second, twenty twenty-three, and meeting minutes for approval April twenty-seventh, twenty twenty-three. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Roll call. Ms. Goodelson. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Ms. Exton. Yep. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. And I vote yes. So that's unanimous. Then we have policy and procedures. Uh, first read file BEE, Mr. Schlickman. Explanation of BEE is uh, our esteemed chair brought up the fact that uh, this policy is a little ambiguous that what it's really meant to apply to are legally mandated uh, public hearings such as the budget hearing and the school choice hearing. And that if we choose to do a hearing, uh, we're not required to go along with the state laws and regulations that apply to state mandated hearings. So we're just clarifying that this is first read will go forward. Uh, and uh, I'll yep. hit the rest in uh, subcommittee liaison. Okay. Any no. comments, questions? No. Subcommittee and liaison reports. Budget, Mr. Cardin. Uh, we are meeting next week on the 16th. Um, to uh, prepare for our finance committee meeting, which we're scheduling for later in May. Okay. Um, community relations, Ms. Exton. Uh, there will be a school committee chat on Saturday, May 20th at 11 a.m. on Zoom, and the link is on the APS calendar. Okay, great. Uh, curriculum, instruction, assessment, and accountability. We are meeting on the 22nd to talk about district goals, uh, I guess we're getting some kind of HGI update and uh, we are hearing about a job description. Okay, uh, facilities? No report. Policy and procedures? Uh, we've met a couple times, including this afternoon. Um, we're still working on ways of tweaking our policies regarding uh, parent and community inquiries on curriculum issues. Um, in Novus today are the thinking of how to adjust it by using KE and KE-R, which that would be a new policy, uh, as a vehicle to um, 
uh, clarify what our expectations are. There's also the Thielman plan, which effectuates a couple of different policies, but basically says the same thing. So sometime between now and two weeks from now, the Policies and Procedures Committee will be meeting uh, to hash out what we'll present back to the committee. We haven't really had a discussion yet. So it's going great. It, it's going great, yeah, uh, except that the chair of the subcommittee uh, uh, got flummoxed by an 8 a.m. meeting and then didn't get the subsequent meeting posted, so we've been a little off kilter. Okay. Mm. Right. Okay. I, yeah. Right. We're, we're getting there. Yeah, we'll, we'll get there. Um, high School Building Committee. Dr. Holman gave the report. October 11th is the is the is the new uh, turnover, turnover, and uh, our communication has gone out to, to the community. And we'll be able to move at that point too. Administration, it's going to be everything. Yeah, us. everything. Yeah, the administration. Except I was, I was preschool. Correct. Yeah. Because yeah. okay. right. the, the discussion was is that we'd be delaying that wing uh, a couple of weeks or something, they, much the same way that the theater was. They they changed. No, they yeah. changed. They changed. They, changed. They, they were originally going to do that, and then they yeah. changed. Except yeah, preschool. Yeah. Okay, I just wanted yeah. that, I just wanted to note that that was different so that we were all expecting to evacuate this building so it could be demolished on, uh, uh, after we depart. Right. And just to reiterate for parents who may be curious, so because we had voted to delay the demolition of this building, the students will have classrooms and places to be going to school full time, normal schedule mm -hmm. until the building, the new building is turned over. Uh, liaison reports? No liaison reports. Announcements? No announcements. Future agenda items? No future agenda items. Okay. I have a motion to adjourn. Adjourn? So move. You just want to say <laughs> okay. Any seconds? Second. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Are you going to send out a doodle? Okay. <laughs> well, let's yeah. vote first. Yeah, vote. We vote. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> Ms. Kittleson. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 Okay. I called out their names. You didn't hear it, but I said it. Okay, thank you.